All right, so welcome to the GraphQL class. And uh, first and foremost, I'm very excited about this class. Like I said in the previous, uh, in the intro video, I think uh, learning GraphQL, um, it's kind of the way forward if you're building APIs and full-fledged applica uh, applications. If, uh, if you're used to the REST approach to writing APIs, then I think GraphQL is gonna be a breath of fresh air for you, simply because it really tackles a lot of the stuff that uh, were implemented with all type of uh, writing APIs, for example, overfetching, um, making multiple round trips to the um, to the server, and it gives you a lot more power and a lot more um, control over your data, how you want to display your data, and how your clients can access that data. And like I said, if you're writing APIs and if you already have an app, um, also one of the best things about GraphQL is that it's very easy to integrate. So in the first part of the um, of the course. We're going to be talking about the server side of GraphQL, then the client side of GraphQL, and towards the end of the course, I'm going to actually talk to you about how you might integrate from an older project to a newer project, uh, or how you might integrate it if you're not switching completely over from an old project to a new project, how you just uh, can start integrating GraphQL little by little into the current project that you have. But again, like I said, um, wait till you learn GraphQL. If, if, again, if you've never dealt with REST APIs, then I don't want to put any of that stuff in your head just yet. I want to show you uh, just what GraphQL is. And if you do come from a, from an old kind of a background where you're used to writing uh, REST endpoints and things like that in Express servers, then uh, again, just wait to the end of this course when we're going to talk about how to do some of the migration. But for now, let's just focus on GraphQL because again, I, I don't want to mix up the concepts and uh, I really want to focus at the beginning, um, you know, just showing you exactly what GraphQL is, how simple it is uh, when you really like, you know, understand it. There's not a lot, there's not a lot of moving pieces uh, and it gives you a lot of control to build really powerful APIs that, uh, that can not just uh, are simple and easy to understand, but uh, are really scalable and um, and are going to be a great uh, addition to your uh, to your application. So, I I just opened up a playground over here, okay? And I'm going to show you a little bit of the application that we're going to be building and uh, kind of what entails uh, in GraphQL. So, this is the Apollo, uh, Apollo server, and uh, this is going to be part of uh, how we're going to be building our GraphQL client. So, this is just uh, this is like a, a little server that allows us to uh, play with our data. So, over here, um, another great thing about GraphQL since it's strongly typed. Um, it, it creates documentation for you on the fly, which again, if you're used to writing uh, API documentation, it's not the um, it's not the like funnest thing in the world to do. Uh, but GraphQL, since it's strongly typed, it can actually do this for you automatically. So every time you use a GraphQL API, uh, you kind of have documentation built in right out of the box, okay, for free. And if you're again, if your team is scaling, uh, I think again, this this just pay dividends uh, down the road as uh, as you start really using GraphQL. So I'm gonna go over here, uh, over here, and then just type in user. Um, so user, it's a query. So I'm gonna make a query essentially. Imagine this this is a client uh, making a request to a server, and uh, once I'm in user, I'm gonna click on the user type, and I'm gonna say, hey, for each user, bring me back their IDs. Uh, their usernames and uh, let's just see what that brings back actually. So I'm gonna go ahead and press play. And then we see that uh, in our database right now, we have a um, we have one user, okay? And that user has a um, has just uh, one ID and one user. So there you go, that's that's pretty much our, our, our data as of, as of right now. Uh, let's see over here, we, we also saw that the user has uh, this thing called pets. Uh, so let's see if we can uh, grab anything, so again, Pets is another um, it's another type on our uh, on our API. So a pet has an ID, a type, uh, a name. So this is the schema of the pet, pretty much. So let's see if we can ask for the let's say let, let's get the name of the pet. Let's get the the type of the pet, and uh, and yeah, let's just press play there. And now we see that um, the data comes back with the user, the ID, the username, and the pets. Now what I want you to focus on. Uh, Again, and I, I kind of want to give you this intro just so you understand what we're going to be building throughout the course. But uh, what you can kind of see right away is we can ask um, essentially for the specific data that we want, okay? We don't have to do overfetching. So if you're used to writing um, Rust endpoints, you might get a uh, default and there, there might be no way for you unless you filter it on the client or on a controller or something to uh, filter down this data, right? Because on your Rust endpoint, Usually you, you might have something like uh, user uh, one and then you're gonna have uh, pets, right? And that, that might be the endpoint uh, for uh, the user's pets. 
Now that endpoint, okay, uh, it's going to return everything like this. But let's say later on that you want to not just get the user's pets, but uh, let's say the pets have uh, vaccines, right? Uh, vaccination, uh, vac vaccination. So then, then you have to, um, then you have to kind of add another endpoint, right? So let's say you have pets, and then you had, you know, for pet one, I want to just get the vaccinations for that pet. Then that will become another endpoint on your uh, on your uh, on your server. And again, over time, this just kind of gets uh, really complex. And even if you have middleware, even if you do uh, structure your app and the architecture to be, um, you know, really well organized. Uh, at the end of the day, you still end up with a bunch of endpoints and whether they get deprecated over time, then you're going to have to do a uh, versioning on your API. So you, ha you might have uh, a V1 of your API that does a certain thing and then like a V2. Uh, and then as your API starts scaling, again, it just becomes really, really, um, really, really complex. Okay. And then uh, onboarding people onto your API and onto your project uh, over time just becomes more and more, you know, it takes more and more time to do. So over here, as you can see, all we did, okay. Uh, to uh, to change this um, this request essentially from from our clients is we just added a few fields right so and then if we go back and then we're saying hey you know now all we want is the user ID and the username again uh, we see that our data and now, now comes back just with the user ID and uh, and the username and now we don't get any of the pet data uh, that we had before okay so that's kind of what we're gonna be building on on the server side okay and then what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be transferring the skills we learn on the server side. Uh, to the client side, and then I'm going to actually show you how the client can make um, requests to the server. And sometimes you might not even need a server, okay? Because um, with React and all these things, you you can just um, the way GraphQL has been uh, developed, you can really uh, just create a um, a single page application, and then just use GraphQL for the query language, which is what it is. It's a query language, as you can tell. It's a, it's a way for us to describe our data. The way we want to describe it and then it's a way for us to query and mutate our data so you we're also going to be learning about mutations if we come over here to our schema um actually let's go to the docs and then we can see that um that if we go to mutations we can also add a pet so it doesn't just allow us to query okay um our database it also allows us to uh have really powerful um really um we can also update and uh delete or or create uh different uh different um different things on our database but another thing i want to also um harp on it's uh another thing i want to emphasize is that the the part of graphql that's really also important is see uh part of uh the way we build apis in our company is a log system so usually our data is very flat now one of the things that um one of the problems that this creates for us versus using something like post or uh, postgres or something like that uh if you're using like kafka uh, and your data is very flat, then, you know, to make relationships happen, uh, it's not that simple. You know, you, we, we usually have to make uh, multiple round trips to the server. So first we get like, you know, let me get one user. Once we have that user, then I have to make another request to the server and say, let me get all the pets for that user. Uh, and then, you know, if I want to get something that's vaccinated, then I have to filter it down to say, and then show me then just all the, um, all the pets that are vaccinated and then that's the data that I end up with. But those are three round trips that we usually have to make to the to the server. In the case of GraphQL, and uh, that's you know one of the reasons why we started mi migrating over, GraphQL allows you to have flat data, you know, where nothing is really, it's, it's not a relational database, but it allows you to create relationships without, no matter what database you use on the back end. So that's another great thing that, uh, that you can pretty much implement whatever database uh, and whatever source you want. So you can get be getting uh, data from many different sources and through GraphQL kind of connect them together um, and then just make one round trip to the server instead of having to do one, then two, then three. And uh, just like, you know, just like how you saw the user, okay, and uh, if we go back to our docs, if we look at users, users usually, uh, the user uh, type just has an ID, a username and pets. But, uh, but it doesn't have, um, how can I say this? But it doesn't have a relationship uh, essentially within the database, okay? So there, there's nothing really that's connecting the pet and the user. Now, if we go to the pet, um, to the, to the pet uh, type, so over here, let's go to pets. So the pet has an ID, a type, a name, and an owner. And that owner is an ID, right? So the, the, there is that relationship, but it's not that we created our database itself. It's not a relational database, okay? So all the data, as you can tell, it's just flat. We don't have, um, it's not like it lives within the, the user. Uh, there's not the user and then the pets, right? So it's not um, it's not like a tree 
structure. It's not a, it's not that type of structure. So even though our data is pretty flat, we're able to create these relationships uh, through the power of GraphQL. And, and again, that's just the intro. Uh, now that you have kind of an idea what we're going to be building, let's get into it. Again, I'm pretty excited. I hope you are as well. And once you start getting your hands a little bit dirty, you're going to see how GraphQL really is powerful. And again, just the best way to like really get a feel for what we're talking about here is just to get into it. So let's go ahead and, uh, and start uh, building our application. All right. So first things first, how about we just spin up a, uh, a little server and uh, just so you can see how easy it is to, uh, to create a GraphQL server. I, I honestly think it's probably simpler than, um, than an express server, but again, that's just my opinion. I'm going to be referencing, uh, some other files just so we can, again, I really just want to focus on the GraphQL part of this course. So even though on the client side, we're going to be using some other tools, for example, um, I'm going to be using a certain database or whatever, uh, just know that you can use whatever database you like. Okay. So, but I really want to focus just the course on the GraphQL part. That way we don't confuse uh, ourselves. Uh, one thing you can do is I have other courses on React if you want to like get more involved into that, into web security, into functional programming. So if there's anything that you don't understand in this course, then uh, check out some of the other courses that we have on uh, on the other topics. Okay, so let's go ahead and spin up a little uh, GraphQL server. So now we're going to import two things from uh, Apollo server. The first thing is the Apollo server itself. And then the other thing is uh, GQL, which will allow us to um, interpolate and write GraphQL queries um, and then get transpiled into the correct uh, query language for the, the server to understand. So now that we have this, okay, uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to create type definitions. But before we get into that, the type definitions, I want to show you uh, there, there's just a few types that you need to understand with uh, gra uh, GraphQL. Remember, since it's a strictly type query language, um, there are some uh, types that come kind of built out of the box with it, okay? Uh, the first one's int, okay? Uh, so you can have an integer. The, uh, the next one is float. So where there's something, you know, it's a decimal or something like that. Uh, the other ones are string. And, and again, these are going to be the ones that are going to be most uh, used. And uh, the other one is Boolean, uh, which is again, true or false. The other one is uh, ID, which is pretty much a string. Uh, but again, that's just uh, one of the ones they have. And then they, they have another scalar, which is date. Uh, but I usually just go with, uh, if I'm writing a date time or something, or uh, like created at, uh, then what I do, it's, uh, I just, I just make a string and, uh, and then that's that. But I, I, I know they have another one called date, but these are the ones that you're mainly going to be, uh, um, messing with. And again, it's just pretty similar to if you've used any other type of database before, uh, this is kind of the standard. Okay. So again, it shouldn't be, an, um, shouldn't be anything new here. Okay. All right. So now let's go ahead and create our types. Uh, so type, um, not type const, uh, we're going to create the type definitions and then we want to use, uh, the GQL, um, the GQL function. And then all we got to do is, uh, pass it, um, the string literals. We're going to be using string literals. That way it gets interpolated correctly when it goes to the server and we're going to create a first type, which is going to be a user. Okay. And, uh, all we want to say right now, for now, we're going to give a user an ID. Okay. Uh, we are going to give it a, um, okay, there you go. So then we want to give it a, uh, a username. Let's say a uh, user has a username, which is of type, uh, string. Uh, now we, we're going to put a bang on it. So this means that when, whenever someone, um, that this, this, this is mandatory. So this is required. Whenever you have a bang, it means that the username, uh, is required. Um, and then let's just for now, let's, uh, let's just put ID and username. Okay. All right, so now that we have our type, uh, our first type, the next thing is we want to uh, make sure that we can tell it what it can query for. So we, we first have to write our types, then we write our query. Um, so what we can ask of this user. So let's go ahead and um, make the second type. So it's going to be called type query. Uh, and then this is going to have a, um, a simple one. So let's just call it me. And uh, if you query for something called me, it's going to return a, uh, a user. Okay. And uh, it, it always return a user. So again, we're going to make sure that, uh, that that's uh, mandatory. Okay. And uh, that's, that's pretty much it. Okay. So we have, again, a type the way that we want our data to look. Then we have to create um, a second type. So th these are the ones that are uh, mandatory. Okay. Uh, for, uh, for GraphQL to work, a query, right? So you need a way to query your data. Okay. The other ones that we're going to get into is mutation, but essentially those are the two things. All right. So you can ask for data or you can mutate the data and then you describe the way your data looks. Right. So when we ask our server now for the me, okay, we're going to we can ask it for me, 
then we can uh, essentially, we're gonna get a user back. And now that we know that um, every time we're gonna say, hey, it must return a user. If it doesn't return a user, then um, then uh, throw an error. So we can also do type validation uh, because again, it's a strongly typed uh, language. Now the last thing, the last thing we're gonna need, it's our resolvers. So the resolvers is pretty much the way that, um, because again, remember, so if everything were to return, and I'm just gonna go ahead and write over here, comes resolvers, okay? And uh, we're gonna resolve the, um, for the query, uh, for, for this query type, okay? So every, every single type can have a resolver, okay? And that's kind of what gives us so much control when we're writing um, GraphQL APIs. Now let's go ahead and write a resolver for the me, uh, for the me um, field, okay, on this query. And uh, what we're gonna say is it's gonna return a, um, let's just hard code it in here. And uh, let's just say we want to return a, an email, an, an ID of, uh, let's just say one, um, let's, it's, it's a string. Well, it's, yeah, it's a string, so that, that's fine. Um, let's call, let's see here, uh, username, uh, username, and let's give that username a, um, let's see here, Udemy uh, user. And uh, let's say, friends, it's a um, it's an empty array at this point. And let me just now again remember you can get, be getting this data, and that's what we're going to be covering uh, more in the course. But you can this data would essentially come from a database. Okay, so this would be a database called, and then you what you can see here it's I have ID, username, and then friends, and then what I'm going to say is friends returns an array of uh, user, uh, an array of um, of other users. So again, your friends are going to be uh, in this case, and let's say that that array is always mandatory. So that always has to be uh, returned. Okay. Um, and then the ID, uh, let's make sure that that's also uh, mandatory. Uh, so that's also required. And then username, um, you know, maybe someone has to use it, maybe they don't, but okay. But again, we're saying these two fields, uh, ID and friends, they're required, right? Because we put this bang. Uh, so we're doing validation. Once an ID, once a string, once it's a collection of users. So friends is gonna be a collection of users. So that's kind of how our data looks, okay? Then we have this query that we're saying, hey, uh, for this query called me, uh, we want to return a user. So always at least we know it's gonna be a uh, user returned, okay? So whenever we, again, on the client side, we don't have to do that validation because we're already doing it over here kind of in the way we're describing our data. And then what we have to do is we have to resolve that, right? So now, now that we have this query, we have to resolve, okay, how do you want me to, um, to actually resolve that? When someone calls that me um, and returns that user, how, how exactly do you want me to resolve that? So uh, again, it has to look exactly how we described uh, the data. And, and again, once we're, we can, we're gonna be talking about one-to-one -one relationships and then we're gonna be talking about fields that are not uh, within your uh, type um, structure, but then you can virtualize through, uh, through the resolvers but we'll get into that later. For now, we just have this, this, and now we can just start up our, um, kind of our Apollo server over here. And uh, let's just, um, the first thing we gotta do is, we're gonna say const server, and uh, we're gonna create a new instance of the Apollo server. And uh, what we're gonna pass to it is the our type definitions, okay? And then our resolvers, perfect. And uh, that's pretty much it. And then we're gonna say server dot listen, and then uh, the then we're gonna get a URL, and then we want to do it. So uh, make sure I have all my parentheses, and then we're gonna say uh, console dot log server is running. Perfect. And then we're gonna do npm uh, yarn yarn demo. Perfect. On uh, okay on. Let's see on what port it's running. It's probably on port four thousand. Just to make sure, running uh, on your. There we go. Let's restart our server. And yeah, perfect. Now we're gonna open up uh, again GraphQL Playground, and this this pretty much comes uh, once you have an Apollo server. This kind of comes with it, so it's pretty cool. Uh, and then we can kind of uh, just um figure out what we want to, uh, we can actually play with our data and see if what the queries were, if 
what the data we're writing, what the query we're writing, if it all um, matches. And again, that's that's it creates a really great feedback loop between um, development and production. And then once you know it's right, then you know the client is going to get it right because you've actually tested it on uh, yourself. So now we have this thing called me. So let's go ahead and um, me. And then me, we know that we have a user, so we can ask for, let's say, let's just say we don't ask for anything. Let's see what happens. So again, we're not asking for anything, so we're not uh, gonna get anything back. Let's ask for the ID. So now we have, um, so uh, although you saw, let's let's come back here. Okay, in the resolver, this is the data that essentially get returned from uh, a database, right? Now, although that's what got returned from the database uh, because we hard coded it, essentially we can ask for anything specifically so over here although it return all this okay because this is the only thing we asked from graphql this is the only thing that it returned to us okay just the id it didn't return to us the username or the friends or anything of that kind okay all right so let's see what happens if we try to add friends so if you remember over here um we said that friends has to uh is mandatory so there must there must be a user um so it, it must at least return an array okay but if we put here that uh, it, it must also have a, a mandatory user, let's see, uh, because remember if in our data that we hard coded, so this is the data with, that we essentially got back from database, this, this array is empty, doesn't have anything. So, but we're gonna ask for it anyways, just to see what happens. So we're gonna ask for friends and then we're gonna get ID. And then let's see, uh, we're gonna play. And now, um, can now query field the user on type query. Um, so again, we got, we got a validation error because the friends are uh, it's um it's empty right we, we return an empty array so let's let's take out the validation for the user and now all we're saying is at least it needs to return a um an empty array okay all right so now we're gonna ask for friends and uh let's go ahead and try to get an idea of a friend now remember friends all we're saying now is that it needs to return at least an empty array and it does return an empty array but we don't have a, an id but at least this time it doesn't throw an error so the first thing I want to show you is just the database. So again, I kind of wanted to abstract away anything that was not GraphQL. So in this uh, in this instance, we're going to be using kind of a um, hard coded uh, database. It's just a JSON file, okay? Um, where we're going to be uh, adding stuff to and deleting stuff and you know this, that, and the other. But it's just a JSON file, okay? This could be again, just think of it as any other database. Uh, we have kind of our index uh, file. So I'm just kind of showing you kind of the the structure of the project this is uh usually a good way that um that i do uh in order for um for the graphical project so over here i have um and again i'll show you later on the client side but this is just server side okay so now we're just going to be dealing with uh writing the server side code so i have the database uh then the demo stuff that's the stuff we we're working on before that's just for me kind of to explain things for you um then we had the resolvers the schema and the server so let's go over that the first thing is the index uh, we're going to be using a uh, low db again it's just uh, a little uh, helper that allows us to um write to a json file delete to a json file and query a json file so that's that's all that is uh file sync uh again that's just something that we're going to be used uh with um with low db in order for the data to be synced uh as we're writing it um so all, all this stuff right here is just setting up the database okay uh once uh, we have that, then we have the create pet model and the uh, and the user model. So the pet model, it's uh, similar to what you might find on any uh, other um, model. So it just uh, it just defines a few functions. Uh, we have to find many, find one, and create uh, for the pets. Then for the users, um, it's here. It's again pretty similar. We have just a user model, find one, or create. Okay, that's kind of the models right there. And then uh, all we're doing is we're ex exporting the, the models and the database in the index file. So that's pretty much it. In the index file, we're just setting up the database, the models, and uh, exporting them out. Okay, uh, then over here we have the schema. The schema, it's kind of what we're going to be working on now. Uh, but again, this is again this is the shape of our data. So imagine if you have a database, a user with an ID, uh, a username, and then a pet that the pets have ID created at a name. And a type okay so that's pretty much uh the schema and we'll be adding to the schema but essentially that's what we're going to be starting off uh on the server side uh we have the apollo server uh we have the type definition so we've um i've gone ahead and um organized it into different folders that way it's easier for us to work with 
Uh, we have the type definitions on one folder, and I'm showing, I'll show you that uh, right now. So, and this is what we're going to be creating now. So the, the other schema was just kind of the shape of our data, but now we're going to transform that, uh, that this starting schema that we started with, the, the JSON one, and we are going to create this one um, that uh, eventually we will um, use for, um, for our project. But for now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and delete all this. And then the, the schema file, which is how you're going to uh, find it once you download your um, once you download your um, your uh, your project from GitHub. This is exactly what it's going to look like. So again, that's what we're starting with. Uh, then our resolvers. Again, this it's um, I'm going to go ahead and make sure that it's empty. Okay, uh, for the pet limitation and we're going to be going over all this in detail okay i just kind of want to show you uh what we're starting with uh the project structure and uh yeah that's pretty much it okay so again we have our resolvers we have our schema that we have to build out we have the the shape that we know our data is in then we have our server uh in the server like uh just like how you saw before we passed in type definitions the resolvers we're going to be talking about the context. Uh, I'm going to explain to you what the context is uh, right now. I'm going to go ahead and delete this and then just pass in um, for the time being just the uh, models and the users. So let me just uh, cover really quick what the context is uh, as we get into resolvers. So resolvers, uh, as we saw in the demo, okay, so as we saw in the demo, what our resolvers do is that they're responsible for resolving uh, the data that we specify in our type. So every time we specify something in our schema, Okay, then we have to write resolvers for this that are going to um, resolve how do we get that data. And as you remember, because um, GraphQL can kind of get data from anywhere, okay, uh, it's up to us at this point to resolve how we get that data. Uh, we can get it from a database over here. In this case, we're going to be using a local database, but you can imagine that we can be using a local database, uh, another um, maybe uh, some other database like Redis or Firebase or like... Um, Postgres database and merging all this data together into one shape that we're eventually going to return uh, to our query. So that's what our resolvers are responsible for. Okay, the, our schema is responsible for describing okay what our data looks like and uh, what we can query and mutate on that data. So it's going to be describing not just what the what the types look like, but also what we can do with that, with those um with those types. We can query them. How we can query them and we can mutate them and how we can mutate them. The resolvers are responsible for making it happen, okay? So GraphQL actually doesn't really care about uh, how the how part, it just cares about the what it's supposed to do, okay? And again, this is all gonna make more sense once we get into it, but that's essentially what the resolvers do. The resolvers actually go ahead and resolve that data uh, so that it returns how uh, GraphQL expects it to be returned, okay? So yeah, let's get into that. now. As we get into resolvers, I'll go ahead and um, and explain a few other things. But let's first and foremost, let's go ahead and uh, for this part of the exercise, let's write our first uh, type. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, get the schema. And I'm all right, perfect. So on the on the left side over here, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be starting with uh, what our data looks like. Okay, so imagine you have some data on some database, and now we're gonna be creating our first type. So the first one is gonna be called user. Okay, uh, and then we're gonna give a user an uh, an ID, and that's gonna be uh, required. Okay, so if, again, and the resolvers. Once we get into it, the resolvers. Remember, once we ask for something on the, on the GraphQL side, okay, then the resolvers are responsible for resolving each of those fields individually. Okay, that's how, as much control as uh, as we can get. So for each of these fields, we can have an individual resolver. And uh, if we come over here, okay, and then I'll transfer this over here. You can see that there's a top level resolver for query and mutation. Okay, and we haven't gotten into mutations yet, but let's just talk about queries. Okay, and for the top level resolvers for queries, then we know that that's the data that's going to be coming uh, in first. Okay, but then you can see that then we have another resolver for the specific type of user. Okay, and uh, what we what we can um what we can do is that based on the information that we get from um from the top level resolver. Let's say that then we have to resolve something that's not on the on the first um, resolver. So let's say we get a list of users, right? And in that list of users, what we do get is the IDs. But then what we want to do is we want to get all the pets associated with that user, which we'll be doing later. 
but that doesn't come from that first request, then we're going to be creating a, uh, a specific um, resolver under the user resolver that allows us to then resolve for that specific field called pets. Again, it's going to sound a lot more complicated right now than it is, but I just kind of want to give you an idea of what's coming ahead. Okay. So here we go. We have the ID and then let's create a, uh, a username, a uh, username. Uh, and that's going to be of type string. Uh, and then let's, um, let's make that that's not mandatory. Okay. So then the next thing is we're going to create a type pet. Okay. And uh pet again is going to be, and again, always have an ID, uh, crucial, uh, even if it's just good practice. So you should always just uh, have an ID for everything, um, that you create. We're going to have a created at, um, field, which, uh, in this case, I'm going to make it a string. Um, okay. Then we're going to have a name, which is also going to be a string. And, uh, we're going to have uh, a type, which is going to be, uh, an enum, but, uh, so we're going to, it's, we're going to get over, uh, we're going to go over enums and all that uh, in unions later, but for now, let's just make it a string and, uh, that's pretty much it, right? So we have, um, we have taken our schema, uh, the JSON and we have created it into the, um, into our, um, uh, into our schema. So that's, that's pretty much it, right? So now we have two types. One is called user. One is called pet. Now the next thing we have to create, it's the query type. So type query. Okay. And then over here, what we want to do it's, uh, we want to create, uh, a few queries. All right, perfect. So now that we have our, um, our schema, now let's go ahead and write some of the resolvers. So the first thing is let's write, let's see if we can get a, um, in our, um, in our, in our schema, let's see if we can get a, um, a collection of pets. Okay. So like, let's just go for that first. So the, the application we're going to be creating, just so you have an idea is going to be a, um, an, an application where you can add pets and see if they're vaccinated. So think of it like a veterinary, um, you know, a clinic or something that have many pets and then they're, they're going to have some data on those pets. So essentially the pets are the, the main, uh, data, but the pets have users. And so we're going to be dealing with relations and all that stuff. Okay. But, uh, let's go ahead and create the first query, which is going to be called pets and, uh, pets. It's going to return a uh, collection uh, of pet of the type pet, and it's going to be, uh, an array. And, uh, that's, yeah, that's pretty much it. So now that we have this query called pets, now we have to come over here to our resolver and resolve that. Okay. So now we're going to say, uh, pets, and let me just come over here for uh, reference sake. Um, so we're going to go pets. And the first thing that we're going to get here, it's, uh, so it, it, every resolver takes in four arguments. Okay. And here are the arguments. Here's what they are. So the name of the resolver has to match okay the, the name of the pets or uh, the name of the, the query so in this case we have pets so now we have to resolve for that uh specific uh query okay so that's uh that's kind of what we're going to be doing over here all right so the first argument in the resolver is a top level argument so again if if you're doing authentication or anything like that that's kind of where this is going to um that this is kind of where where you're going to uh do it and and again i'll show you how to do that usually uh, what I like to do is I like to include it over here, uh, from in the, include it from the server. So authenticate the user ahead of time and then, uh, just, um, throw it in in either the context or in the top level. But again, we'll get into this uh, a little bit later, but that's kind of what that, that first argument is. Okay. The next argument it's, uh, inputs. So, uh, actually arguments, args. So if, um, let's say that you're doing pets and you want to say something like, um, uh, let's say limit, and you want to limit it to five, right? So that's something that we're going to get into once we get into arguments, but for now we don't have that, but that's going to be coming right here. So that's going to be the second, uh, kind of the second parameter that you can, um, that you can, uh, include the third uh, parameter is context. So context, again, uh, I like to do it through the server. So it's just, you know, uh, once you create your server, you, you add your type definitions and your resolvers. And then you can add your context as well. Okay. Uh, in our, in my context, I included the models that I showed you uh, earlier. That way we can create and, um, delete and do everything we want to do to our database, uh, from the models. And then that, that just makes it easy for me. I also included database, not really necessary, but in case we want to do any debugging or anything, uh, that's, um, that's fine. Okay. So again, you include your context here and then you get it over here in your resolvers. Okay. So include it in your server. Once you start your server, you can include anything kind of in this context, um, uh, function, whatever you return here, will get included, will get included into every resolver. Uh, so any information, anything that you want to share across resolvers, 
you're going to want to do it in your context. Okay. That's kind of the way to think about it. And then, uh, and then there, there is one last uh, argument, but you usually won't be using it. This is, um, usually if you're using some like very advanced features of GraphQL, like, uh, abstract syntax, uh, syntax trees, or, you know, it's again, usually unless you're creating GraphQL tooling, you won't be using this uh, last one. But again, I just want to show you that it's there. If you want to do uh, a little bit more um, research on your own, then go ahead and do that. And then we have the context. So now that we have pets, um, now that we have the, the pets uh, resolver, then let's go ahead and uh, return uh, models. Uh, yeah. So since I include, I don't have to include the model. So I just, that's kind of the reason why I include in the server over here, uh, the models. Okay. That way I can access it through and the resolvers through the, through the same name. And then we're going to say, um, models, uh, dot pet. Okay. If you remember, let me just, again, just so we don't, nobody gets lost. Um, we're going to go to the index. Where is the index right here? So in the index, remember we created that create, um, pet model and the create user model. And so we have models.pet. That's what I'm accessing over here, models.pet. We have it over here. Okay. Um, so then we're going to go ahead, models.pet dot find uh, many. Um, and then let's just, if, if we don't include anything, then that should just return a, um, all the pets. So it's given us an error that we included a mutation, but we haven't included it in the, um, in the schema yet. So I'm just going to comment that out for now so that we don't get that error. And then let's go back to our server and, uh, let me just refresh it and go back to docs. Okay. Now we have pets and we have, we can see that we can make one query called pets. So let's go ahead and, uh, let's try to do that. So for the pets, and if we go over here, we can see that we can, uh, ask for anything in, um, in our pets. So let's ask for an ID. Um, yeah, let's just go ahead and ask for an ID and let's press play and then let's see what we get back. So as you can see now, what we get back is a collection of pets and their IDs. Okay. And that's kind of what we described over here, right? So we described uh, a type query called pets, which is going to return a collection and inside that collection is going to be a collection of what of pet, which is this type that we created over here. And, uh, it's uh, mandatory. So whenever someone asks for pets, then at minimum, they have to return an array, right? So this resolver, we have to make sure that it returns an array. If I, if I do like, let's just change the resolver. So I'm going to change it to returning a string. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and ask for the information again. And then you can see the, the, the message you got is expected iterable, but did not find uh, one uh, for the field of query pet. So in this case, so now the resolver is the resolver is the one that's responsible for making sure that this gets satisfied, right? So we have the resolver called pets. Okay. And we have this query called pet. So now we have to resolve it. So we, we created the same name. Okay. We're accessing the models, but now we have to make sure that whatever data we return back. Okay. In this case, uh, minimum and minimum, we have to satisfy this case was it, which is, it needs to be a collection. Okay. Inside that collection, it needs to be a pet. Now in, uh, inside that collection, let's say we ask for, um, let's say that we, um, the name, uh, whenever we ask for a name, it has to be, uh, required. Uh, so it can be no value and the type also, we don't want it to be no. So we know that, uh, and the created at also cannot be no. So now we're, we're saying, Hey, anytime someone asks for any of this stuff, uh, it actually has to get returned. So now let's go back to our server, uh, an ID, um, let me see if it refreshes on its own should for the most part, uh, expect the iterable. I already changed that. Uh, let me save the resolvers file. Okay. And, uh, now, now we got the ID. So as you can see, every path has an ID. Let's continue. Uh, let's see if we can ask for uh, something else. Uh, ID. Let's see what else we can ask from pets. Um, let's see their names. Let's ask for their names. Perfect. And the type. Okay. And then let's see if we get any errors there. So now we have uh, pets, which is a collection. And within each collection, we have the ID, the name, and the type. Okay. For each one, uh, the name Simba, uh, Garfield, Cat, Tessa, Luna, Miso, and Batman. Okay. So now, and, and all their IDs, right? So perfect. That's kind of exactly what we wanted uh, our data to look like. So now we've gone ahead and created a few types. Okay. So that's the first thing we, we have to, uh, we, we have to remember, right? So we have the, the, the shape that our data, okay. That we want it to, to be, 
Okay. Um, we can add validation on here. Okay. Then we can add queries. So what can we ask of this data? Okay. So now we have we created this query called pets. Now one of the main differences between GraphQL and uh, and when you're thinking about REST uh, APIs and endpoints, it's GraphQL usually will only have one endpoint. As you can see here, we're, we're making all the requests to this one single endpoint, okay, which is great. Um, but it's not going to be, you know, you don't have to think ahead of time of making all these, um, you know, single endpoints that just, um, that, that kind of return one uh, type of data. Within this one endpoint, you can satisfy any, uh, any request that the client might have. And the way you do that is through your resolvers, okay? So now that you have this query called pets, then your resolver is what's um, what's responsible for figuring out how that information um, it's 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 gotten right. So it could be from and it like GraphQL doesn't care where it comes from, how it comes. It just needs to match. Okay, it just needs to match what this um, what this query expects. And in this case, the query expects that it's a collection. That's all it expects. Okay, it needs to be at least a collection. Okay. Uh, and if it's uh, inside the collection, uh, if something does get returned, then it needs to match the pet, okay, uh, the pet type. And we know that the pet type, it needs to have an ID, a created a name, and a type. Now, none of these things will get resolved unless um, unless we ask for it, right? So let's say let's say I, I'm going to add another type here, and uh, I'm going to call this um, let's say legs, okay? So let's say we have uh, legs, and legs is going to be an int. And uh, then we're gonna say that's uh, that's required. So maybe we have uh, many pets, and now one of the things that we want to do with our pets is we want to figure out if they're like um, you know, four legs or two legs or whatever. Okay. Uh, so now if we come over here and we ask for this, now we're not gonna get an error. Okay. But as soon as soon as we ask for legs, okay, since uh, since I know our data does not include that, now we we have it says it cannot return null for a non nullable field pet.legs and then it tells you exactly where the error is right so we know our data if i go over here into uh, the db uh the json we know that nowhere in our in our, in our pets we have uh this this field called legs okay so now what we could do is we can come over here and say hey you know what legs is not necessarily uh mandatory so we know some of our data at some point had legs some of it doesn't but you know the ones that do uh let's see if we can actually get it back and now if we come back over here uh we we can't get a null value so that that is something that um that's expected uh but in our resolver uh if we didn't want to get a null value then we can iterate through the resolver at that point and then make it a string or something like that something that's not null right so we can say uh map um pet and then we can say um we can say um let's just return uh, whatever was in pet, uh, but then legs uh, also make it, um, you know, let's just make it zero for now. Okay, uh, let's just make it um, two. Let's make it two. Okay, so now at least it won't be, uh, it won't be empty. Okay, and now we, we're gonna, we're gonna add the bang again, so that way it's, uh, it's mandatory, so it's required. And as you can tell, we didn't, we didn't get an error this time, right? Because uh, we, we did account for that in the resolver. So within the resolver, we accounted for the fact that. We knew sometimes uh, we were going to get legs or no legs. So we can say, uh, you know, if, if it does include a leg, include it. If not, uh, let's just, you know, at least not return no. And then that way it satisfies. Um, and then over here, you see that I try to return a string. But as we can see, uh, it also told me, hey, you know what? It's supposed to be an integer, not a string. Uh, so at minimum, we can just return zero. And then now um, we can see that our resolver definitely satisfied uh, all the conditions. For uh for our query right for this query of pets it's it's an array uh the array does match uh, our pets um shape okay uh and then uh, whenever we ask for something as long as we satisfy it over here in the resolver then we we're, we're good to go okay and our API will work so I'm gonna go ahead and delete uh, the legs and the, um and uh, the string so let's just leave it this way and now we've we've gone ahead and created our so now again let's just remove legs because that's not there anymore and then uh we're back to having our data with id name and type and uh yeah we've gone ahead and created our first uh types okay we created our first query so now you know for every query you can just i, I can i can name this whatever i want okay so i can say all pets for example okay so all pets so now if i go over here okay and I ask for pets now now we're gonna get an error because um let's see here uh let me wait for the for the server to restart. 
So actually, the server is not even going to restart. So what it's telling me is, even before it compiles, it's saying, hey, um, you have a query uh, that pets defined in resolvers, but not in the schema. So it's saying, hey, over here in your resolvers, you have something called pets, but nowhere here in your schema do we find that uh, that query, right? Like there's nothing under the query um, under the query type. There's nothing called all pets. So like, what you know, what are you asking for? Like, I, I have no clue what that is. So what we have to do is we have to change this to all pets. And then our server will restart. And now what we should do is, uh, now we're still going to get an error over here. Now, what do you think we're getting that error for? Because we don't have, we can't query for pets anymore. Now we have to say all pets, right? Because that's what our schema now uh, has. So now if we do that, then we're back uh, in, a, um, in a passing state and, and we're good to go. So again, your resolvers, um, you can, so I'm, I'm just going to rename it pets again. So just to reiterate, okay, um, just to reiterate, over here, uh, you, you have the shape of your data, right? So this is your kind of your database, however you want it to look, okay? Over time, you can then uh, add these queries that are going to be um, queried against this, uh, this one endpoint, okay? And the, the endpoint is just one. So all your GraphQL endpoints, for the most part, all your services can kind of go to the same endpoint. You don't have to worry about making different endpoints uh, for everything. Uh, the way we get around that now is, that we have these things called resolvers. So it is up to your resolvers to resolve all those queries. So over here, we're gonna have the queries, uh, we created a query called pets, and then we, we went over here to a resolver under query, we created pets. Um, again, we accessed the, the pets model, we imported it from the server, so we're good to go there. And uh, and then we say models.pet.find.many. Again, this again should be just familiar at this point. And, uh, and what we get back, is exactly what we expected our um, our data back and everything's working fine perfect all right cool now we got queries and um types out of the way let's get into inputs so inputs like i said kind of go over here so one thing you can do for example it's you can add inputs to any field okay or to any query so let's say that um now that the inputs okay it's something that um once once you define it then it's stuff that the user or the client can send in. And again, we're gonna go through the demo of this, uh, but that, that you might want to use um, on, on your resolver at some point. So for example, let's just uh, go ahead over here and create one, um, one simple one. So again, the, the way you do this is very simple. So let's say you want to have pets and the pets um, you want to maybe filter by uh, type, right? So type and the type has to be a string. Uh, so there you go. So now you have pets uh, type string and over here you are going to have in um, in your uh, input that uh, type and um, And yeah, so now you can you can do something with this type on uh, on this um, on this resolver So if you know if, if the types included or not included so for example, you can make it also um, uh, re required type. So in this case, now the type will be included, and then maybe you can filter down by type or uh, or whatever you want. Actually, you know, so it doesn't um, so it doesn't um, so so, so at that, that point you can you can kind of do any, any other uh, any other thing you want. So that, that's the first uh, place that you can add uh, inputs on. Okay. So again, remember inputs are uh, arguments that the client can send in, and this is how you allow for that. Okay. So if you want your client, uh, maybe for pagination or whatever else, you know, it's just like a function. Uh, any information that you might need uh, to allow you to either query your data or do something with that data that you're gonna need, then that's where you do it, right? So you do it through input. So the first thing is, remember, it could be uh, passed in uh, directly just like that. And again, the scalars are the same, or we can do it this other way, okay? And then now we're gonna introduce a new, um, a new, um, scalar to um to to graphql and this one's called input okay so instead of just writing type it's the same thing so we can put a uh, pet uh i i like to call them so over so you can actually do this input pet and then define the input um whatever whatever you want uh but again now you have these two things called pet uh once a type and once an input so that does tell you the difference uh but i like to be a little bit more explicit i don't like to um i don't like to be that clever uh, and then so I put pet input. Okay, that's just again. I think it's clearer But there is nothing stopping you from actually uh, Doing this because uh, once one is a type and one is an input. So actually GraphQL knows uh, What um, what it is, but uh, in either case, 
I, I like to put input. So that's just, that's just my convention. You, you guys can do uh, whatever you want, okay? Uh, and then let's say that you can uh, filter, let's say we're gonna be filtering down uh, these pets. Uh, let's say you can filter by type, okay? And then that's also gonna be a string. Uh, like it's not mandatory, so that's just not our, we're not gonna put a bang. Or let's say that uh, that you want to do it by um, name, so name. So maybe you wanna get a specific one. Okay, uh, and then that's also gonna be a string, uh, not required. So now over here, uh, what I like to do is I like to put input, okay? And then I always like to call them input uh, because that allows me to get them over here in, in my resolver. And then it, I know it's gonna be, um, there's gonna be something called input over here. Um, and then what, uh, what you can do then, it's that you can pass a pet input, okay? You can pass a, a type, okay? So if, if you, Although let, let's say that this um, that this input looks exactly like this type, okay, and then that that might give you the idea that you're like, okay, why don't I just pass the the pet type, okay? You can't do that, okay? You have to pass the input, the pet input. Uh, that's how GraphQL works, okay? So in this case, um, so yeah, that's just a caveat that I want you to uh, that I want you to know. So if you do need input, okay if you do need uh, some arguments to be sent in from the client that you're later going to be using on your resolvers, then what you have to do is you have to create an input or you have to put them in um, here as a scalar. So as, as we did before. Okay. And also you can make them uh, required. So let's say every time someone um, uh, is going to query the pets, they have to do, uh, they have to include a pet input and you know, but over here um, they can actually uh, write the type or the name. So either of those, would work fine uh, if that's required. If not, let's say that when they uh, require then so the pet input is not required, but if they do put it, then the type is, it is required, right? So they, they better include a type, uh, but they don't necessarily have to include a name. So there, there's a lot of combinations that you can do and gives you, again, a lot of flexibility on, um, on your end to really define uh, your schema the way you want really define your query the way you want. So then that way there are no surprises. Okay. And then that way you can really write, uh, your resolvers, um, to match, um, to, to work exactly how you expect them to. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to use that input. Okay. And then I'm going to show you how it actually, uh, works out on the, um, on the, on the server side. So we're, we're going to do here. It's if someone passes input, then we're just going to pass it right along. Okay. Perfect. Uh, and then we're going to create a new, um, we're going to create over here a new query. Okay. Just called pet. So imagine instead of pets, now we're just going to include pet. And, uh, for our schema for pet, what, uh, when, what we want to do is we're just going to pass in an ID in this case. So instead of passing in the input type, we're going to say ID and that's going to be of uh, type ID. And let's say anytime someone wants to actually, um, query a pet they do have to pass the ID. But if, again, if, if it's pets, then um, they can pass in a pets input, but they don't necessarily have to, okay? So now what do we have to do? Okay, what do you think we have to do after this? Now we have to write that resolver, right? So for pets, uh, for pet, we have to write the, the, the resolver. So again, over here, we're not gonna worry about that uh, the first uh, argument. Then we know we're gonna get an input here, and we know we are, because we, we required it on the, on the query type over here. Okay, great. And then we're going to go to our model. Okay, great. So now our resolver, uh, what's it going to return in this case? So in this case, we're going to say return models dot pet. Okay. Dot find one. And, uh, we're going to pass, uh, the ID to it. Okay. We're going to pass an object with ID. Um, and then let's, let's see over here. Error query, uh, query dot pet defined. Uh, huh in resolvers, but not in schema, uh, pet, pet. Okay. Yeah. Pet is going to return. So there you go. That's going to return a, uh, a pet. And then that's, um, it, it can't, it can't return nobody. So it's going to return a, a pet, uh, no matter what. So that's, we just got to make sure that our resolver, um, accounts for that. Okay. So now, now we have these two resolvers. So let's go ahead and, um, let's go ahead and, uh, and use that. So over here, were for the pet were instead of input because we didn't actually uh, write input in this one since we just wrote a scalar and I want to show you uh, both examples. Uh, then over here, what you're going to get over here, it's what you typed in over here, right? So over here is ID over here, since we wrote input, then over here we get input. Okay. So that should be 
we should be good to go. Okay, now let's go to our server. Okay, and then let's um let's see how this works. So let's first uh do the pets one. Okay, so let's do pets and let's pad in. Uh, so remember that what it takes is an input, and that input. Uh, let's just go back here. We can either uh, pass in a type or a name, and they're both strings. So let's pass in a type first. Okay, uh, and then what we're gonna say is we want to get all the let's see um dog everything has a dog and then for whatever returns we want to get the, the the id and the name in this case we won't actually get the, the type because we should all uh, well actually just to just to make sure we do actually get all dogs let's let's actually um uh request the type as well so let's go ahead and press play on that and as you can see we have all dogs so now our um we have filtered because of our resolver and the input types we've included an input okay so now we're filtering our uh, our collection from all our pets just to the pets uh, with the type dog. Okay, and then we can change this to cat. And what we should see is now we have just two um, two records uh, of the two cats we have in our uh, in our database. Or we can just go ahead, type dog again, um, and there you go. We can also put name, right? So we can put um, name, and let's go uh, try to fetch Garfield, okay? And we get Garfield back, so we can say uh, Garfield and type um, cat, and we should get the same record. So, but maybe there's another Garfield that's a dog, okay? But we don't, we we actually don't have that one in our database, okay? But maybe again, let's say you had a database, and you know, essentially you can have the names are not uh, necessarily unique, but the types might be, or something along those lines. But in this case, we're not going to get any pets back because we don't have a, uh, a dog named Garfield, but we do have a cat named Garfield, right? So although those two conditions are met, and then we do get our, um, our record back. So now let's go ahead and do the, the pet query. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're just going to search pet, okay? And actually, let me get the ID here uh, because I don't want to go search through the database uh, now. And then let's just put ID. And then let's, um, let's see here. So that's going to be the ID, and let's see if it finds it. So models is not defined. Uh, let me see what I what did I get here? Model, model, model. There we go. Cannot read property pet if undefined. What, what am I missing here? Models. Louise. Louise. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. So now we do have uh, that pet with that ID. And then let me just go back to just so we are sure uh, DB uh, uh, JSON. Let's pick another pet. Let's pick a different one here. Let's pick Batman and Batman. Let's get Batman's ID over here. Um, and then we're going to switch it. And then now we should get back the that pet Batman. Right. So now there you go. Those That's arguments. OK, so the way you use arguments. OK, it's um. It's like this, okay. So now you have pet. You can pass in an ID, or you can pass it in the other way uh, that we specified uh, earlier, which is through the pet input. Okay. So now you have these two types. You can create either create an input if it's going to be more than one. Okay. If it's going to be, or if this gets too complex that you're like, you know what? It's it's not like as simple as just an ID. Uh, I prefer just creating an input. Then you have uh, this way of creating inputs and passing in arguments that way, or you have this way of just doing it. Uh, the scalar way, okay, and then just you know, in this case, it was simple, so we just need an ID, and that's what we passed to our resolver. Uh, but in this other case, we passed in a whole input, and uh, and then that's what we use, okay. So, anyways, that's how you can pass information from the client onto the server, and then use it uh, on your um on your on your actual resolvers to resolve that data, okay. So that's how GraphQL passes information. All right, so let's think about what we've done so far. So we can create types. Okay, and this is the way we want our data to look. We can then create inputs, right? So if we need to pass any information, we have a way to pass it into our resolvers. We can create queries. So pretty much we can ask for data back. We can, through our resolvers, then resolve that query to match the data, right? How it's supposed to look. So what's next? So pretty much the next thing we got to do and we should talk about is mutation. So mutations are a way for us to update our database. So anytime you're doing an update, a delete or a creation, right? So if you know CRUD, create, read, update, uh, and post, I believe, uh, and delete, uh, then it's that you know that final part. So create, 
uh, update and delete. So the create, uh, update and delete part of CRUD, we go through the uh, mutation on, uh, on GraphQL. Now, just like uh, type query, mutations are a special type. So we're going to create a uh, type mutation. Perfect. And uh, what we are going to do then is we first have to update our, uh, our schema, right? So let's say we are going to say, let's say we're going to create a new pet. Okay, so that's going to be the mutation uh, we're going to create. So just like someone can query for pets, then someone can also um, make a mutation. So what we're going to say is we're going to say add pet. That's going to be the name of our mutation. We can name it whatever we want. Uh, it's going to take in an input as an argument. Okay, and usually if you are, if you think about it, okay, uh, anytime you want to do a mutation, usually that um, those um, those functions will take in some type of input, right? So it, like, let's just think about it logically for a second here. If we need to update something, then you need to know what to update, right? So you like someone needs to tell you what are you going to update. If you need to delete something, usually um, the client tells you, hey, this is what I want deleted or whatever. Uh, if you need to, um, let's say, uh, update, delete or create, if you want to create something, then they need to tell you, this is what I want to create. This is the data that I need uh, to create this stuff. So usually when you're doing mutations, uh, since it's not just reading data, uh, you're actually going to um, change some um, some state in some uh, in some store. Then at that point, then you do need uh, some input. So most mutations do actually have an input. Again, I'm sure you can come up with um, ways and reasons why that's not true. But I'm just talking about the, the normal cases where usually we're building our applications. Most mutations have uh, something like this. So in this case, we're going to create a new pet input. Okay, and now the new pet input, it's mandatory. So it's required. Otherwise, you know, it's like, you know, if they want to add a pet, but they don't include the fields we, we require, then we can't really do that for them. Okay, so then, and what that's going to return, it's just going to return a pet. Okay, so now what we want to do, it's we're going to create a new input called uh what's it called what do we call it new pet input let's just copy it so we don't make uh any mistakes and then what uh what's going to be required is going to be required uh a name okay so our pets are going to have a name uh then it's going to be a type and that's also a string and uh let's just say th those two fields are required okay so that's perfect so now that we have that Okay, that's pretty much all we need uh, to create our, our mutation, right? So now we have it in our schema. So first we have to add in a schema, right? Then what do we have to do? Then we have to do it in the resolver. So now we have to resolve that uh, that mutation. So just like in query, we have uh, those um, these these two queries that uh, people can perform. So someone can perform against our API. Now we're gonna add one mutation that someone can perform against our API, and that uh, is called add pet. Okay, and just like before, um, for the for the add pet, we're gonna have a parent uh, info that we're not using yet. So let's just leave it uh, for what it is right now. Uh, then we're going to have input. Perfect. Uh, then after input. So again, the reason we have input over here is because we're that's what we called it when we created the mutation. Okay. Uh, then we're going to say models. Um, and let's say here and then users. Uh, if uh, But we, we're not going to use that just yet, actually. Uh, we'll leave that for later. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So now that we're going to have our pet, we're going to say return. Um, let's see here. So we're going to say um, const pet equals models dot pet. Great. Dot create. And then uh, what we're going to pass is the input. Um, and then that should be. Um, and then again, we can return. Um, let me just. Um, I'll just return pet over here, but you know, there, there's a lot of talk about, you know, what should a mutation return or not return again, at this point, it really is up to you. Um, if you want the mutation to not return anything, that's completely fine. Uh, usually, you know, it's, I, I usually try to return the thing that just got, um, mutated, uh, or the thing that just got uh, updated. So that's what I usually return. But again, that's just my convention you can just return no, right? You can just return nothing at all. Uh, that's just um, specific to you. I think the most important uh, part of the mutation is this piece over here that the mutation did happen. So again, whatever you want to return that allows the user to know that actually that uh, the mutation happened or it didn't happen or whatever, uh, it's up to you. So again, the mutation can return whatever uh, you want it to return. Um, since again, at, at this point, the, the main idea of a mutation is not so much that we're querying from information, we're trying to mutate something, but still I think it's a good idea to always return something. 
So let's go ahead and um, let's go over here. And now, unlike um, unlike queries, okay, now we can check our docs. So yeah, we have the iPad mutation. So let's just use it now. Okay, so let's go ahead and do, we're gonna do add pet. And then the app pet, remember, uh, this takes an input. And that input is, takes a name. Uh, and uh, let's create, um, you know, a pet name. Let's give it a name. Uh, I don't know, you know, um, it's gonna be a dog, uh, Lucky. It's called Lucky, okay? And then let's give it a type. Right, let's just go back over here. So yeah, a type and a name. So the type is gonna be dog, okay? And then um, when we return it, let's just, um, let's just return the ID. And let's also return the name and, and the type, perfect. Okay, now before we actually run our mutation, there's one more thing we have to do, which is over here, uh, we need to specify that this is a mutation. So whereas in query, we didn't have to specify, I mean, we could, uh, but it's it's like usually uh, it's explicit, um, it's implicit in uh, when you're writing uh, GraphQL code that the, the default is a query. So when we're writing a mutation, we do have to specify that this is a mutation and then let's run it. So now we say, um, so now our pet, okay, has been added, and this is the data we return back. So remember, you can return back anything you want, but uh, since we return back a pet, I can ask for anything that's included in the pet, okay? Uh, and we just included uh, the ID, so this is the ID that got created. Uh, we got the name, Lucky, and then the type of dog. Now, if we go back to our, just to make sure, okay, just to make sure that it did happen, uh, let's go over here, and then we see in our database that we have uh, a new uh, record of our, you know, of our new, newly created uh, pet. So again, let's think about it. GraphQL up to this point, very simple, okay? Uh, all you need to know is types, okay? Queries and mutations and inputs, and, and then your resolvers. That's pretty much all you need to get a handle on what GraphQL is. And it, it allows you to have all this level of control and granularity on how you build your APIs. They can be strictly typed. And that, again, that gives you a lot of benefits if that's, um, you know, if that's what you want. Uh, but again, it gives you the flexibility in your resolvers to resolve it however you want, right? So you kind of have the best of both worlds, I think, over here. And you don't have to be uh, constantly making round trips to the server. Uh, you can kind of just figure it out at once, kind of what is the data that you want, have your resolver or um, resolve it however you want, and then return it, right? Uh, so again, we got queries, mutations, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So let's go on to the next uh, part of the video where we're gonna dive in a little bit more into some other uh, topics that are a little bit more advanced. But these are the basics, okay? Once you understand these basics, you can pretty much uh, start creating your own GraphQL uh, APIs. And uh, I think you're well on your way, okay? But let's get, I wanna show you a little bit more advanced stuff, uh, not just on the server side, but also on the client side. All right, so let's go over enums. Um, so enums, again, it's a little bit more, um, more advanced. That's kind of why I wanted to leave it uh, for later because I didn't want to confuse you. But again, it's pretty simple. So let's imagine over here. Uh, so we have our pets, right? And let's say we have the type. And right now we have it as strength. So enums are these things you can uh, create. So enum. Uh, and then we're going to call them, uh, let's see, animal. Yeah, let's call them that. <clears throat> so enum and then uh, animals. Um, and then what you want to do is, uh, let's say there's an enum. And then right now we can say dog or a cat, right? So let's say that those are the only animals that we want to, um, that, that we want our API to be able to um, to handle. Okay, so animal, and then we created this thing called enum. So it can just enumerate over this. So now any, anywhere we, we can uh, put a scalar, then that's another place where we can put an enum. So enum, wherever you see a scalar, can be, um, can be um, switched for, uh, for a scalar can be switched to an enum. So let's go ahead and where, where it says pet over here, Instead of putting string type, let's put uh, animal, okay? And then uh, let's see here, uh, pet uh, type. So that has to be an animal. And then a uh, new pet input also has to be an animal, okay? So now we just can't, uh, it just can't be any string. It has to be a very specific string of the animals that we do support, okay? And uh, let's just um, save this. And if we go back to our code base, so let's try to add a uh, let's try to add a um, a new let's let's make sure that it's in our 
in our pets and we have the name the string so that's the string let me just refresh this so i make sure that uh it's correct and then we go to pets and what we see here for name i type we see for type that it is an animal right so if we go over here i'm just gonna go ahead and delete this um just so we can see uh lucky and then as soon as we type type um what we should get okay it's a cat or dog right but let's say I try to put in um, I don't know um, let's see lion right let's say let's say we try to add uh, a mutation and then as a type we put a uh, lion what, uh, what we're gonna get is we're gonna get a um, expected type animal but found lion so lion is not something that we uh, we actually support so let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and change this to dog instead and then uh, let's give our dog another new name. Let's call it Einstein. Okay, Einstein. There we go. All right. So now, since we did uh, give it a type dog, uh, we're gonna go ahead and run that. And then that actually did uh, get ran, and that ran uh, correctly. But as you can see, so now enums are a way for you to specify uh, either or cases. Okay. Uh, but you only want to um, support a, a certain subset, not all the subsets. So maybe you want to replace it from a string. Or maybe instead of integers, you want to just support a certain type of integers or like, you know, uh, like 5, 10, 15, whatever it is, you know. Uh, anytime you, you find yourself in one of those situations where you want to specify a specific subset and not something so broad or abstract, then uh, you can rely on enums. And enums are a good way uh, to do that uh, in GraphQL. And then you can replace any scalar for, uh, for your enums. And uh, that's pretty much how they work. All right. So as we wrap up on the server side part of GraphQL, and I really hope that you found this uh, not just useful, but um, easy, okay? That you can see that it really allows us to build really powerful APIs in a very, I think it's easy to learn. Um, and again, easy to implement. It could be implemented just in sections or, you know, a whole project. But anyways, let me show you one last piece, which I think is important, which is the relationship part of GraphQL. So if you're used to dealing with something like Postgres, uh, Postgres or SQL or, or any type of those databases that have a uh, relationship uh, built in, then you know that you can do pet dot, you know, um, or user dot owners, right? And then it'll tell you, hey, these are the owner or, of that user of that, uh, of that pet. Or you can do something like um, owner dot pets, and then it'll show you all the pets of, the, of, that, uh, of that owner. But what happens if your data looks like this, right? Where our data for the most part, it's, um, you know, it, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty flat, right? There's, there's no relationships. All we have are these, um, are these uh, records, and then we have a user uh, model and a pet model, but there, there's no real uh, relationship. So there's nothing like, for example, there isn't uh, just to um, showcase what I'm talking about here. There isn't something like this that under pets for each individual user, you have uh, a record or um, you have um, an array. Of then of pets right so like that's not that's not how this is stored okay so that that would be a, uh, a relationship uh, type of data so how do we get that then into our um, into our schema how can we resolve for those things because there, there are gonna be these scenarios where we do want to know hey show me all the pets of these this owner okay so let's let's get into that now and uh, let's figure out how that uh, how that'll work okay so we're gonna add something to the user and that's gonna be pets so we're gonna add that new field and then uh, let me just make sure, uh, just so I don't make any mistakes here. So pets, again, it's just gonna be uh, a collection of pet. And uh, it's gonna be, uh, so if it does return any pets, at least we know it's gonna be at least an array, okay? And that's pretty much all we're gonna do. But again, remember, we don't have uh, this way. So how do we resolve this? Now, one way to do this, okay, it's again, that hierarchical model or that, re that relationship model where you nest your, uh, within the user, so every user has kind of their pets built in, okay? And then that's just how you resolve for that. But GraphQL allows us for a much better model than that, okay? And then that's a field level resolver. So although we don't have a user, okay, in our data, we know that once we get a user back, let's just uh, let's just make sure, okay? Let's just get a user, okay? User, um, and then for an ID, uh, let's uh, say that we want a uh, username, uh, and then that's pretty much it. Let's just go for that for now. Okay. 
Uh, can a uh, query field user on type query? What do we have on the docs? We have a pets, pets, pets. Okay, so we haven't created something for user. So let's create something for how for user. Um, so the query user, let's create a new one. Let's call a user, and then that's going to return a user. Okay, and then let's uh, let's do that again. Let's actually let's resolve for that. Um, on the on the main uh, on the main query, so over here we have user, okay, and then user is going to be uh, that we're going to take in an input, um, then we're going to say models, and then user. So over here, I also want to show you something else on the server. Remember, I told you how you can pass in the context. So over here, we only have one user, but this is where. Again, if, if it's coming from the client, over here is where you can create some middleware or figure out another way. This is another way that you can pass out data from the um, from the client onto the database, um, onto the GraphQL schema, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, um, we're gonna go back to our resolvers over here and then where we have user, we're gonna say, um, let's see here, user, okay, great. For the user resolver, we're gonna say return uh, models dot user dot find one all right uh and then let's not have that uh and then we don't need this for the time being either let's just put models uh because we only have one user but again if, if you had more than one user that's one way that you can authenticate and uh once once we go over authentication, uh, we're gonna we're gonna bring in the user in a different way. But for now, since we only have one, this this should be fine. Uh, so yeah, so we have models. We're gonna find one. So now we get our user. Now this is again this is what we call a top level query, right? And the way we can tell this is a top level query because it's right here, right? So under query, we know that that query is right there. Query user. So now we have query user. Okay. So that's a that's a top level query, which is um which again. Uh, usually what you would want to do, right? It's you would want to, you can imagine that you want to do something along these lines, ID, and then make it, uh, make it an ID, right? But for now, since we only have one user, we're not going to do that. Okay. So we're just going to, uh, we're just going to bring back that user. And then if we go back to our uh, schema, then we get back our, uh, our user. Okay. So now that's, that's all working fine and well. Okay. So now we have this user with this ID. But let's say that we have um, this user has pets, right? So let's say we want to uh, bring back pets, and for each pet, let's uh, let's say we want to bring the ID. Now we can now return null for a non null field uh, user pet. So we're saying over here, if it does bring pets, um, we want uh, to bring those pets. Um, like give, give me at least an array of pets. But we don't have a resolver for that, and our, we know our user. Okay, um, remember if if we go back over here, we know that our user model. Okay, does not have uh, that built in. And if we can just go over here, we go user. Okay, um, we can see that the user model only has ID and username, so it has nowhere pets, right? So pets are nowhere here. All right, so now we're gonna what we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, we're gonna resolve for this specific field over here, right? So again, the reason we have to resolve for it specifically is because that's not uh, it's not in our user model. So we have to virtualize it. So somehow we have to resolve for it, right? Because we're, we're saying that they can ask for this. So since we can ask for it, uh, but we don't have it in the model. So this is the way that we can create relationships. So again, under user, okay, we're going to create a field specific resolver. And this one's going to be called again, pets. And for pets, now this is where we can get the first argument. Now the first argument here, since we're under user, we know we're gonna get that user um, um, object, okay? So, and, and the only reason we know that is because we're doing that under the user. So by the time, that this is what gets resolved first, okay? These top level queries get resolved first. Now, if everything comes back perfect, then that's, that's what gets returned. But let's say that, like for example, over here, since we're asking for pets, once it gets to this user and it doesn't return it, then GraphQL is gonna come back down here and I say, hey, I, there is something missing here. Okay, that's, that sh cannot be missing. So let me see if they resolved it under the user um, under the user um, query object, okay? And then over here, that's what we have to resolve for it uh, specifically. So, but at that point, then GraphQL is gonna pass to us whatever it, it returns from here. So whatever was returned from this, that's what's gonna get passed here, okay? That's the first argument over here, all right? So now that we have that, 
we're going to say we don't need the second argument at this point and then we're going to uh, also include the models uh, and then what we're going to say is return and now we're just resolving for this specific uh, field on the user uh, model so we say models dot pet dot find uh, many okay and then we're going to say uh, for the user we are going to say uh, user dot id all right and now let's see if we can actually query for that so this now we're going to ask for the same thing we're going to ask for pets okay and then for pets we're going to ask for an id and let's see what comes back and now as you can tell we have relationship just as if under user we would have had this data there which we obviously don't right type and uh not just type but uh let's say name okay now uh, if again imagine being on the client side and you want to uh, populate a UI so even though your data is flat okay even though there's no real relationship between these two um these two uh, data models okay we can virtualize them and then that way we can create a relationship between them through uh, field resolvers okay so if we do um so as you can tell here we have now because of pets we have a specific field resolver that resolves just that specific field okay we're getting that user and instead of having to return more data than necessary so over here right our model it's only going to return id username uh that's all that the model has honestly right like the way our data is uh set up in our db.json that user that's all it has right but a user can have pets but again it's not under the user model so how do we then um how do we then create a relationship between these two data models over here that we have or that you might have in your database and that's the way we do that okay so now what we should be able to do also it's let's go ahead and under the pet, uh, let's put uh, owner. Okay, so now uh, a pet can have an owner. And uh, what we want to do is it's going to return a, uh, a user. Okay, so let's see how do, how do you think uh, we'll resolve for that. So now because a pet can have an owner, okay, now we actually have to uh, also um, write that on the, on the pet model. So under pet, we're going to go ahead and write owner. And, uh, and then what we're going to do is we're going to go pet. So remember, it's going to resolve the top first, right? So when we ask for a pet, okay, we're going to get the, that pet uh, first, okay? Then we're going to say, um, we, we don't need the second argument at this point. And then we're going to say models. And then after models, we're going to say return. Okay, great. Models.user.find, find one. Um, and then we're going to, uh, get the ID um, from the pet uh, pet dot user. Is it pet dot user or pet dot owner? It should be pet dot owner. Pet dot owner. Right. That's what we should have because it's uh, let's see here. Pet owner. Yeah. Pet owner. So there we go. So now now we should uh, be able to search for a pet and then also ask for an ID. So not just do we have one one relationship or uh, one to one relationship. We can go the other way. So now let's search for a pet. Or actually, let's get pets, okay? And for pets, uh, let's return the name, the type, and then also the owner, uh, the owner. And for owner, let's return the ID. Okay, how about that? And there we go, right? So each pet now, we can get not just the pet, but also the owner of that pet, right? And then now we know which is the, which is the, the owner of the pet. And then we can also do it for an individual pet, for example. We can do pet, uh, and then what do we have to pass in? If you remember the ID, uh, so actually when I go to pets, let me just get the ID so that we have it here. ID, perfect. Okay, and now what we're gonna do is uh, let's see here, pet ID name and the type. What does it say? Pet argument ID of type ID is required. Uh, it's pets. Uh, so now let's get for Simba. Let's see if we can get that uh, that to work as well. So we're going to go ahead and say ID. We're going to input that ID. And now we should uh, be able to get just one record. But for that record, we also can get the owner or not get it. Right? We can remove this. And then at that point, we're now resolving for it. So again, the resolver, that resolver is not going to get triggered. But if we did ever need it, then we know that all we have to do is say owner. And now our database uh, knows what to return. And we're not overfetching, so whenever we need it, we have it, and whenever we don't need it, we don't have it, right? So that's that's kind of the power, and this is how, this is where the graph part of GraphQL really comes in, where you can create these relationships 
even from flat uh, you, uh, models, okay? So the models don't have to be nested uh, like you would in, uh, in other models. So every time you bring back, let's say a user, all the pets also come back, right? Just because that's the way that that, um, that that database was created. So in this way, you can create different models, okay? You can have many different sources, uh, a user database, a pets database, or whatever else you need. And then at this point, right, whenever you get to, the, um, to the writing your schema, then you can describe whatever virtual field that's not gonna come back from your database, and then all you do is in your resolvers, you can resolve it. And then that's really where, I, I think for me, uh, that, that was a huge win for um, especially for the way we develop our projects where we're usually using uh, flat models or logs and the logs don't necessarily have any relation it's not a relationship uh, relationship database then GraphQL allows us to act as if our database was uh, something like Postgres uh, or, or anything like that and uh, we don't see any difference in uh, in either um, you know performance or, or anything and we can perform really complex queries that uh, will be really uh, hard to do in other databases so uh, you know this way you can kind of create any query kind of you know the sky's the limit your whatever usually your uh, your client needs uh, will be you'll be able to satisfy that with GraphQL okay so that's pretty much it okay so now we've covered uh, relationships mutations types pretty much everything that we need on the server and now what I want to show you is so this way you can create a perfect API and if you're just on the back end, okay, and your whole job is to create um, APIs, then you're pretty much uh, offset over here. But I actually want to show you how do you combine GraphQL on the server and the client side and everything we've learned uh, for the server, now we're going to apply it on the client. And then you can see how not just through, uh, through the playground, how we can ask for data, but actually asking for data on a real uh, application, okay? And then displaying that data and everything we're gonna do with the data, okay? So that, that's the next part of the course. And, uh, and then in, at the end, we're gonna go over authentication and then how do we uh, migrate our projects from whatever, um, you know, if you're using something that's not GraphQL to a GraphQL uh, structure. All right, so see you in the next video. All right, so let's talk about authentication really quick uh, because there's a lot of ways to do this and I kind of want to give you, you know, a, at least a, a basic understanding just so you see that there isn't a lot of magic going on here. So once you kind of, you know, from everything we've covered over here, okay, literally this is the core of GraphQL. The, the rest of it is like structuring your folders, your application, organization, and all these things. But kind of what we've learned so far, that's pretty much all GraphQL L is, okay? And it gives you that much power. But Remember, so let's think about authentication. So how do you authenticate and what do you want to authenticate? Uh, there's this thing called directives, which we'll go over uh, on the client side. So let's just wait for that. But let's say right now you're just on the server side and that's all like, you know, this is all you want and you kind of want to lock down your server, right? So you want to say, hey, only if someone's uh, actually authorized, should they be able to access any of this? Okay, so let's go back to our server. Okay, and uh, like we said, uh, Apollo is just a an Express server. Okay, it's just some like wrapper around Express essentially. Okay, uh, and then over here in uh, in context, let me just um let me just go back over here. So yeah, over here in context, what uh what ends up happening is that you have access to uh the request object. So let let's say you wanted to do something. Um, let me just yeah. So let's say you wanted to do something. Uh, you know, like async and uh, then you have something along the line so like throw um, so we're gonna check first if there's a user authenticated right so we're gonna say um, you know maybe we're checking for cons JWT uh, you know is auth okay um, equals and then you say request dot headers uh, the authorization and then that gives you a token um, right so like let's say that's how you get your token and then you, you can do something like throw uh, new uh, error um uh not off right so what you're doing over here you're you're, you're kind of you know you're, you're checking at every request uh if the authorization is uh is there or not and if it's not then uh you're gonna throw an error okay so let's just uh let's just see how that works so yeah just so you get an idea so again everything looks good right now right so then i'm gonna make a request and then there we go. That's the that's the error we get, right? So context creation failed, no auth, right? So I was like, okay, so that's one way to lock down your your whole API. And then what you do is, if you do have a user, okay, so um, let's say um, you do have a user, then you just pass it in um at this point. So right, so what we're gonna do is um, so we're gonna say, let me move it to the top of this, okay, and then we're gonna 
do it this way. So I remember at this point, we only have one user, but again, however you're doing your authorization logic, just imagine that that's what you'll be doing over here. And again, there's other ways to do this. So I'm just showing you how to lock down your whole server, uh, kind of as if it's behind uh, an authorization all and only, uh, only authorized uh, users can uh, access your, your API, okay? So what we're gonna say, we're gonna say if um, user not, if it's not a user, then, uh, then, then throw the error, okay? And then um, at this point, we, sh we should be good, okay? So we're gonna go back to our server and then we're gonna ask for a data and then that's, uh, we're, we're authorized, okay? So let's, again, if, if, you know, if we were to comment that out and then we, we got it back, Right, we we're gonna get the no auth um, user is not defined. So in this case, we're getting user is not defined. Um, so yeah, so there you go. Okay, so now we have a user, and only if it's the user defined, uh, then we can pass the user around. Okay, so we, we can come over here, and then we can see that uh, wherever we have um, user. Okay, although in this case we get it from there, but over here where we have models. Okay, uh, you can actually pass in the the user itself, and uh, and then for pet, you know instead of just getting models, you can get the user as well. And then anywhere you need user, that's how you pass it in. Uh, it's, it'll come in from the from the request. So that's one way to deal with authentication. Uh, but essentially what, what you know, really what you're trying to get at is, um, and what you should understand is that it, it, it really shouldn't be um, that much more complicated than however you're doing your authentication right now. So maybe, but what is cool with uh, GraphQL, because you have all this level of granularity and control, that you can actually um, specify that, let's say for example, let's say uh, a person can query uh, a pet and everything about a pet, right? But it can only query the owner if, um, if, for example, if it's an authorized user, right? So then you can come over here under pet and owner, then uh, you can say user, user, right? And then, uh, and then you can return, you know, if, if it's not a user, you can return something. And if it is an authorized user, then you can return something else. And then that way you can just lock down that specific, right? Like this specific piece of, uh, of your API to only authorize users. So that's really powerful that, uh, that again, it would just be really complex logic to do with anything other than GraphQL. And that's what GraphQL allows you to do. So if, if, you, if you can understand this and you can wrap your head around these concepts that, uh, that we've covered in this part of the course, then really you already have a great um, understanding of GraphQL and you can pretty much start implementing it, you know, as of right now, essentially, okay? Uh, what I would say is, you know, start getting your hands dirty, okay? Play with it a little bit. It gives you a great playground uh, that you can start just writing stuff and then querying it or uh, doing some mutations and then figure out how, how it works. And again, you can do async away, you can do all these things um, and get really your hands dirty and see what comes back, uh, start making some queries, some mutations, and then see what happens, okay? In the next part of the course, we're gonna be covering the client side of GraphQL. And uh, and I think that's really going to, um, to enhance our knowledge and see how you, we can do a full stack application, not just the server side, but uh, we can do everything from beginning to end uh, using GraphQL. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. Okay, so see you in the next video. All right, so now let's go over uh, the client stuff. Uh, and the client, again, what you're gonna see is that a lot of the stuff that we already learned for the, um, for the server side is very transferable uh, to the client side. And one of the best things about uh, the Apollo client is that it does a lot of stuff um, out of the box for us. So it, the Apollo client um, will do all the fetching for us, uh, which is great. It also has the, the ability to do caching. So if you're using anything like Redux or um, local storage or anything like that, Apollo can handle that stuff. Um, so again, it's, it's gonna be pretty cool. Uh, another thing that I want to go over, it's, uh, so let's say, um, which again, will help us in the clients, which is query operations. So a query, okay, uh, can have a name, okay? And uh, for this name, let's call, and query operations before I get into it, it's a way that we can pass information dynamically that uh, from the client side that we will later use uh, to serve that data on the, on the server side. And again, don't think of it so much even as a client server model. This could be peer to peer, as in it could be a single page application, but uh, one uh, portion of your uh, page is what's serving, uh, it's, it's gonna be the Apollo part, and then the other part is gonna be, so one, one, one section essentially is gonna be just the data fetching, and then the other part is gonna be just um, the data rendering, right? So you can have React in the front end or View or whatever, and then Apollo can serve as the data fetching part. So if you remember, so to, in order to create the dynamic variables, what we have to do is we first have to give it a name, okay? So we're gonna call it input. Uh, and then what we have to do is we either have to give it a scalar 
So an int or, or anything you want. Now, if you remember, I'm gonna, I wanna go through an example here. For, uh, let's see here, for pets, for pets, we have a um, pets uh, input, uh, pet input, right? So we have the, the pet input that, uh, that we created, if you remember that. So we can put here that it takes in a pet input, okay? And then that's perfect. So now the next thing that uh, we can do is over here, once, uh, once we are actually going to perform the query, then uh, all we have to do is we're gonna have to do um, input and uh, what we pass to it is the name of the variable that, uh, that we gave it, right? So in this case, it's a little backwards, right? So we give it a name first and then we, um, we put the, the input type that we created during the server part of the course and then on the on the pets part, it's just like how we learn uh, from the uh, server part of the course, right? So we put the name of the of the field it takes in, and then instead of putting the pet input, uh, we we uh, we put it by reference, uh, which is uh, we use the same reference name, right? So we put input on both sides, and then that should be uh, that should be uh, all good to go. So now over here we get to say uh, things like filter, um, yeah. So we go input. And then uh, once we have that input, uh, we can do, um, for example, we can do um, name, uh, and then let's go Batman. I think we have one called Batman, right? So there you go. And then if we run this query, we should get um, that uh, we get back pets uh, with, uh, it's a dog uh, named Batman, so we filter correctly. Uh, we can also put type here, right? And then if we want uh, just uh, to get a, uh, Query of dogs, we get that. If we want a cat, we get that. Okay, so there you go. Uh, so again, those are just dynamic queries. Uh, also named uh, queries, there are, this is pretty important, especially on the client side. The reason being is uh, usually when you're using an Apollo uh, library or an API, third-party API, you really uh, want to give it more meaningful names usually uh, that means something to you uh, as, as, uh, as opposed to what the author did. And then that's, this is a great way to wrap your queries in, uh, in a name. And then this is the way that we pass the arguments in uh, programmatically. Okay, so from the client side, once you get um, you know, some user input, then you can pass it in uh, through name queries. So then the other thing that's really cool, it's um, let's say over here that we, um, we get data.pets, right? But let's say that we have, you know, we're, we're trying to standardize or normalize our data or our, uh, or our views, you know, ahead of time. So one thing that we can do, one thing at least that I like to do is I like to make this uh, results and th these are called aliases, okay? So an alias pretty much allows you to rename uh, your query and what gets returned. So instead of uh, this being called pets, we're saying, hey, uh, make this uh, called results. And, um, and then as you can see, then it aliases it. So that's one way that we can make everything uh, that we return back. So if we were to make, uh, let's say um, all pets too, uh, bring back the same thing, except over here, I'm gonna include an image. If I run all pets two, again, it says data the results. And if I run all pets one, it says data the results. Uh, and again, that's, uh, that's one way that we can normalize it. So again, these are just little tips that I like to use myself. Uh, and again, I wanted to show you the programmatically, how to include um, fields programmatically, not just in the playground, but this is the way that we're gonna be doing it on the actual, uh, on the actual client side. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna walk you through, um, I wanna walk you through the client. Uh, the first thing we wanna do is we wanna make sure that our uh, server is still running, and then you wanna open up another terminal, uh, and then you, uh, you, you're gonna run yarn, um, yarn app. Okay, I'm already running it, so I'm not gonna run it again. Uh, and as you can see, let me just show you. So anyways, uh, we're gonna be going through that, so no need to worry about it now. Uh, but what I do wanna go over is the folder structure. So we have, again, it's a simple React app. Uh, we have the client JS uh, and then index.js. So first and foremost, uh, index.js. We have an, an Apollo provider, uh, which is, again, it's just gonna help us with uh, Apollo and React hooks. If you haven't uh, used React before, um, I suggest you check out our other course that goes over React uh, in detail, hooks and all that. Um, the, yeah, that, that will be uh, a lot more uh, in detail. In this course, we will not be covering React. I really wanna focus it in just on, um, just on uh, GraphQL and, uh, and working with GraphQL and that data. But in, it, in, in, but in, in any case, 
uh again you know uh if you don't know react then just go check it out but it shouldn't be an issue i'm gonna try to abstract all that away from you just so we can focus on the data fetching part okay so we're gonna have a an Apollo provider that we're gonna pass the client to okay and as you can see we exported uh the, the client over here then uh then our app gets uh instantiated and it's pretty much uh set to go right so that's uh that's pretty much all we have uh then if we go back to um over here, this is pretty much where we're gonna write our code. And then we have pages. This is our React application. Um, again, just a pretty simple React app that, uh, that we're gonna be building um, throughout the course. Uh, most of this stuff, we're going to create it ourselves, so I don't wanna give anything away. And, uh, and yeah, so the next thing that I wanna do, it's uh, let's go ahead and start our, uh, our React application now and, uh, and then start, start getting uh, Start getting on it. So the next thing I want to do is uh, I want to start. Up a so the next thing I want to do is I want to start a React application, and uh, let's just get started. All right. So the first thing I want to do is I want to get our client working. Okay. Just so let's go ahead and do that. So what we need to do is we need to start our. Let's start our Apollo um, server. So this is not going to be a server. This is kind of how we started on the client side. Again, very similar. Um, you, you'll see to how we did it on the, um, on the server side, but again, Apollo is going to provide a few things for fetching, caching that, uh, that we weren't doing on the server side that, uh, that's going to be, uh, make it really, um, useful to work with on the client side. So the first thing I want to do is, uh, we're going to create a link, cons link. And, uh, for this, we're going to create a new, uh, H, um, HTTP link. This is provided for us from the Apollo link HTTP, um, module. And then over here, all we have to provide is a URI. And uh, I'm gonna copy this just so I don't make any mistakes from our local host directly. There we go. After we have a link, now you don't have to use a cache, uh, but again, um, you, you probably would want to anyways for local storage or anything like that. Just, you know, uh, it's just a good standard. So I'm gonna go ahead and teach it to you with uh, by using a cache. And again, if you don't want to use a cache, then you can go ahead and, uh, and remove it. Uh, it's fine either way. Uh, so we're going to use the in-memory cache in this uh, instance. And again, this is just something that you get free out of the box. So you might as well use it. Uh, Apollo does all this uh, for us. So it's pretty cool. Uh, then we're going to create a client, our client. And uh, in this case, we're going to go ahead and create a new Apollo client, uh, which again takes, and I'm again, if you see me looking back and forth, it's because I'm using uh, one of my references just so, um, so that I don't make any mistakes. And then we're going to, we're going to add our link and then uh, we're going to use, um, and then that's all it needs, a link and a cache. Okay. At, at least at this point. Okay. Then uh, let's save that. Okay. Then if you see here, we can say, um, let's first, let's just make a uh, simple query. So we're going to so, go ahead and say const query, uh, just so you see how this uh, works. Um, and then we're going to use GQL. So just like how we did on the server side. And at this point, you know, you should be familiar with this. This is the same thing we're doing on the server. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and make a query for pets. And I want to get the ID. Uh, let's see, what else do we have on the pets? We had the uh, ID, the type and the name. Let's, let's go ahead and get that type and, uh, and the name. Great. And then what we can do is we can do client.query. And that takes in a query. And uh, that's, that's pretty much it. All right, so now we have a query and let's just see, I, I think this should work uh, now. And then as you can see, this is pretty much our app. Um, again, it's just a little app it says uh, the, you know, the pet's name, what type of pet it is and a little image. And then we can go ahead and add a new pet um, right here. And that's pretty much it, okay? So yeah. Let's um let's go ahead and start creating this, and then I want to show you how we can add our stuff. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm actually going to delete almost everything from the database, so we're working with uh, fewer data, and, and that way we can just build up to it. Okay, so that's pretty much it. We started our first client, and um, then I'm going to show you how to query from the database, which again you can almost see here that we're about to do it. Uh, but again, it, it should just feel very similar to how you were doing it on the server side, and then you'll see that most of it just transfers over thing i'm gonna delete this query because we're actually gonna be doing it on uh for real this time so now that we have most of our clients set up okay 
then the next thing we want to do is um, we're actually not going to do it this way. Okay. We're going to go back to, uh, let's go back to the index. And then I just want to make sure we go over this at least uh, so I explain it. So we're exporting, we're creating our client, and then we're going to export that out. Then we're going to go back to index. Now in index, again, if you've never used React, just go over the uh, React course. It'll be much easier. But for now, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be importing two things. We're going to be importing that client and this uh, Apollo provider. And the Apollo provider, we're going to see right now uh, kind of what uh, it allows us to do. But what, what we have to do is we have to wrap pretty much er anything that's going to be using uh, GraphQL on um, uh, around this Apollo provider. Okay, so the Apollo provider, uh, we're going to wrap our, uh, our app around it, right? So our app is going to live inside of this Apollo provider. And then anything that we pass to the Apollo provider, it's also going to get passed to anything that lives under it uh, or inside of it. So we have over here the client. Uh, and again, this could be anything, but um, well, actually this has to be client, but th this could be anything uh, you want. We input it as client just to, um, so there's no confusion. And then uh, just pass it along onto your Apollo provider. And that's pretty much all that you have to do on the, on the index side. Now, if we go back to pets, uh, now here's where most of uh, most of our work is gonna happen. So the first thing that we have to, and I'm gonna go ahead uh, over here just to make sure that um, I'm referencing the correct uh, documents. So the first thing we see that we have a loader, and again, the loader. Let me just open it for you. It's a simple component uh, that just have a uh, has a little loader uh, uh, GIF. Okay, so that's all that is. It's just a simple component. Uh, but uh, what we're gonna have to do now is we're gonna have to use uh, we have the modo and the set modo. Again, uh, you'll see that um, once we um, once we render and uh, populate the the pets card, then uh, that modo is going to show up. Okay. So then we have uh, what we have from Apollo React hooks is this use query and this use mutation hooks. Okay. And again, if you never use React, it's not that complicated. We're going to go over it now, but I think if you take that React course, it'll be a lot better for you. Uh, so the first thing we want to do, okay, it's uh, we're going to go ahead and um, and then we're going to implement that uh, that hook. So that hook comes back as I think it comes back as data loading an error. Okay, and then we're gonna use uh, use query. Perfect. And then for what did I copy here? Use query as our hook, and uh, this is gonna take a query. Okay. Now we have to write our query. Uh, that we haven't written yet. So let's let's go ahead and write a query to get uh, the, the pet details. So we're gonna put const. Mm, we're gonna say uh, all pets. Okay, and then this is gonna be GQL. Uh, then you're gonna use the string literals. And then over here, what we're gonna do is uh, we're actually gonna hit our um, our our server. Okay, so over here we're gonna say uh, pets. And then we're gonna get the ID. We're gonna get the type. We're gonna get the name. And then we're gonna get the image, okay? And what we're gonna do then, it's we're gonna go ahead and pass that as the query that we're gonna use for all query. And then we have to account for um, for these other states. So, so over here, what we're gonna do, we're gonna say if, uh, if it's loading, then what we wanna return is the loader. Okay, the loader components. Perfect. If uh, if error, what we want to do is we want to make sure that we. Uh, I'm just going to return a simple um, p tag over here that says error, and then um, over here on our pets list component, then we're going to pass around pets, and uh, that should be. Um, so what we're gonna get over here, okay? We're gonna data uh, dot pets. And actually, this is spelled incorrectly. Loading, okay? And then it's gonna be uh, data dot uh, dot pets. Perfect. And uh, we have an error over here on this uh, because I didn't write return correctly. Okay, return, and then that should be fine. So there we go. Let's go back to our application. Again, um, if we don't see any errors, we can see that, uh, that that's fine. The reason why we're not seeing anything on the page 
it's because I've gone ahead and deleted all the pets. So how about we just go ahead and hard code one in uh, into our JSON. Um, so there we go. And then we're gonna say, um, let's go ahead and look at, we can look at our schema on the, on the server side. So schema, just so we can see what the, what the pet has. Okay, so we're gonna give it an ID of, uh, of one in this case. And that, that's a string, so let's make sure. The ID, yeah, it's a string. Uh, we're not gonna include the created app. We're gonna create uh, a name. We're gonna give it a name of, um, you can give it whatever name you want. I'm gonna call it uh, Tessa. Okay, uh, the type, uh, let's go ahead and make it a uh, dog. Okay. Uh, the owner, we're not gonna worry about that for now. And then uh, let's uh, for the image. Let's uh, let's see if we can find a uh, pretty good image of a um, of a dog. So over here, let's um, let's just write something. Let's just return a string because uh, I think I have a resolver written that actually overwrites this uh, this property anyways. So now if we refresh over here, we should see a, a dog named Tesla. And, uh, and a picture of a pet. So there you go. Okay, our query is uh, it's working. And again, let's just go back to uh, the pets component. And what we should see, let's just make sure nothing uh, broke. So what we should see it's um, we wrote our query over here. Okay, and let's just go back over it. Uh, remember, we wrapped around our app on the on the Apollo provider. Okay, and we imported it uh, both the Apollo provider and the client. So that gets passed along. Um, to pretty much all our components that live under the app. We wrote our query over here, okay, the all pets query. We passed it to the use query. This brings back uh, three states, so data, loading, and error. Uh, then we just kind of have to account for that, okay? And again, you can you can get as um, you can get as creative as you want for this. Uh, the loader is pretty cool, um, but uh, again, you don't have to, you can you can figure out a better error message if, uh, if you want. So then after that, we just pass to the pets list, uh, the list of uh, pets. At this point, we only have one, but if you remember on, um, and over here, I also suggest that you do download the, um, the Apollo pets, um, pets, um, I mean, not the Apollo pets, but the Apollo uh, Chrome extension, uh, because it's very similar to what we were doing over here in the playground, except on the client side. And then we can, uh, we can play around and say, hey, I want the ID. The, the name and uh, and the type, okay? And then we can just go ahead and see that, yes, um, we're getting that even if it's not showing up on the on the client side before we actually um, write some something for the view, we can go ahead and uh, and test it out on the client side, just like, like we're doing on the on the server. So this is this is very helpful. For example, if you're hitting a third party API that uses GraphQL, but you necessarily are not using GraphQL, or are starting to use GraphQL, but on the client side, then uh, you can still um, you can still uh, have a kind of a playground when uh, when you download the Apollo um, Chrome extension. Okay, so I suggest I'll uh, go ahead and uh, download that, which gives us um, you know the ability to do uh, kind of uh, the same thing we're doing on the server. So yeah, that's pretty cool, right? Uh, pretty simple. Uh, then let's go into mutations and let's see how we can add pets uh, through the through the UI instead of um, instead of hard coding it into the database. All right, so now that we can query from the database, uh, from the client side, let's go ahead and make a mutation on the on the client side as well. Okay, so the first thing I want to do, okay, it's um, I'm gonna go ahead over here, and then I'm gonna put a um, I'm gonna call it mutation, and then we're gonna give it uh, a name which is uh, create pet. You can name it whatever you want. Um, let's call this uh, input, and then that's gonna take a new Let's, uh, let's make sure we, we get our schema correctly over here. And then that's going to take in a new pet input. Perfect. Uh, so from there on, then we're actually going to call the add pet um, function, which again, takes an input field uh, where we are going to pass this input variable. Perfect. And then after we have that, then we can pretty much uh, return anything we want. So name. Uh, let's say the, let's see, what are we returning on the client side? Mm, let's go back to pets. And over here, we're getting the ID, the type, the name, and the image, right? 
All right, so the ID, the type, the name, and the image. Okay, uh, and then when we come down here, query variables. Okay, let me just uh, let me just expand this out for a minute. Then uh, we got the the new pet. Okay, um, over here I call the create pet, but uh, you can put it as input because that's actually what what it will be. Uh, so the input, and then what we need to pass to it is the um, the name and the type. Okay, so just like we're doing on the server, uh, that's all. Uh, that's what we're gonna be uh, doing over here. All right, and then let's go ahead and uh, and run it. Let's see if that uh, actually gives us a uh, a new pet. Um, let's make sure we don't have. Uh, yeah, so we don't have a dog named Batman yet, but we're about to have one. All right, so we were getting an error. The the reason why we were getting an error, it's uh, I forgot to put the bang. So if if you don't get the bang over here, right? Uh, and then run this, I'm getting an error code. The reason being, it's if you remember in our schema, okay, uh, this for the add pet, the new input is mandatory. So whenever we uh, actually create a, um, um, let's close this. Whenever we create a uh, ourselves a, a query, we also have to make it mandatory, right? So again, it's just very strict on uh, in that sense, which again, it's a good thing. So, and, and it, it'll have very good errors. So if, if I go come over here, right? And then I click on this, um, so it's telling me what it's expecting. And then as you can tell, we didn't include the bang. So as soon as we include the bang, then that uh, error goes away. Uh, down here, again, we just put exactly uh, what we have here. It's called input. If it's called input here, then it's gotta be called uh, input uh, down here as well as the variable. And then uh, we know that the new uh, in pet input type takes a, um, let's see over here. What, uh, what do we have? We have a, uh, a name and a type. So that's what we give it, a name and a type. And then we're gonna go ahead and uh, run it. And as you can tell, now we have a new um, a new mutation of a dog thing, uh, Batman. Now, one of the good things, uh, one of the things that you should take under account um, is that whenever you create something, okay, um, you can return whatever you want. But part of uh, using Apollo, and if you do it this way, that if you return the same thing, okay, if you think about the queries that you write, okay, and the mutations that you're gonna be doing, and you return back from the mutations, the same things that you query for, then we can, uh, Apollo, what it can do for you is that it can cache it, and uh, besides caching it, it can also update the, the client side for you uh, behind the scenes. So it's always a good idea, if you know what, uh, what your queries are gonna be, uh, okay, what you're gonna be asking from uh, the, the server, it's always a good idea that whenever you do a mutation, that you return the same thing that you're going to be asking for, okay? And then that way, Apollo behind the scenes can um, can just do a lot of, um, you know, it's not magic. I mean, you can do it yourself, but it does a lot of it for you, a lot of the heavy lifting, so you don't have to do it yourself, okay? So then in this way, let's go ahead. Uh, now that we know the mutation is working, if we click back here to home, uh, what we should see is two pets, one named Batman, one named uh, Dog, uh, uh, Batman and Tessa, and then uh, that's uh, that's pretty good. So let's um, let me try to re. Okay, I really want to get that. Um, see if we got that mutation. So again, uh, do download the Apollo uh, tools. I think they're um, they're pretty awesome. And then mutations, they're just pretty similar to um to uh, queries. And now let's go ahead and do them on the on the client side. So I'm gonna go back over here to pets, and now we're gonna add our uh, our mutation. So just like we did for the um, when we were doing the all pets, I'm gonna go ahead and create a const and uh, let's call this the new pet. Okay, new uh, pet. Uh, and just like before, GQL, uh, string literals. And then over here, we're just going to ha uh, go ahead and uh, copy and paste this. I'm gonna indent it a bit. And then that's uh, that's pretty much it as far as far um, as far as that goes. So again, if it works, that's one of the great things about downloading the, um, the Apollo app uh, tool. So if it works here, you can almost guarantee that it's going to be working on your client. So there's not that much work. I always try to test it on the um, on the graphical or on the playground if I'm working on the server, and then that way it's um, it's not that much of a hassle. Now another thing that uh, that we imported from Apollo wasn't just use query, but we also imported use mutation, and use mutation uh, it, it's going to bring back uh, two a uh, tuple, so it's going to be two array. Uh, the first one it's going to be that uh, new pet, okay. So we're gonna say uh, this is the new pet, and then the new pet function, okay? So this is the function that we're gonna use to create that new pet. And then 
uh, the second thing it returns is the actual pet once it's been created, okay? Uh, and then we're going to use use uh, mutation, and then that takes the new pet mutation. Uh, okay, perfect. And then uh, what we have to do over here now, it's uh, it's set it up on the on the submit. So once we submit the, the modal, what we're going to be doing is uh, we're going to be instead we're going to be running this function, okay? And uh, what we have to do is we have to now pass in the variables. So lucky for us, uh, the input that we get here, um, so we're going to get variables. Okay, and that's how you pass that. And then lucky for us, uh, the input we have uh, is exactly what we need. It's that on uh, the new pet input, okay? So all you have to do here, uh, and again, this is all hooked up already for you. All you have to worry about is the GraphQL part, okay? So you don't have to worry about anything else. Uh, we'll, um, so once we pass that input to the variables, then uh, then we should be good to go. And uh, and let's see if this actually works. All right, so what we want to do now is, um, all right, so the next thing is, now that we have the, the use mutation uh, hook set up, now we want to use it. So the first thing we want to do is we want to run this function called new pet. Uh, and then this uh, takes one, uh, we're going we're gonna to provide it for now, uh, one, uh, one uh, in the object type, it takes uh, the variables that you want to uh, that you want to pass. So in this variables object, remember what we named it over here uh, called input, okay? Uh, which is the new pet input. So whatever you you named it there, that's uh, that's what you want to uh, name it down here as well. So I I named it input my, uh, myself, and then uh, for input, uh, since what we're getting over here, it's actually the same thing. I actually don't uh, we actually don't have to do uh, anything else, but uh, just just for uh, the sake of um. Of, uh, of the example, if I would have named this, for example, new, uh, then over here I would have to change this to new. And then down here, you would have put um, variables input, and then what you pass in is that uh, variables new, it's uh, that input, okay? Because remember, it's going to want to uh, get the new uh, variable, okay? So then just remember that, okay? It's whatever, whatever you pass here, it's what you're going to end up uh, doing over here. So I'm just gonna undo all that, and I'm gonna leave it as input. Um, and that should be good. Okay, great. So now that we have that, um, then we should be able to create through uh, through the UI a new pen. Now let's go see if this works. So I'm gonna go ahead and make this a little bit smaller. I'm gonna click new pet. Uh, we're gonna create. Let's create a cat. Okay, uh, Garfield. And then let's add the pet. And uh, it didn't get added immediately to the to the to the page, but we didn't get any errors. Okay, at least I don't think we did. So yeah, no errors here. Uh, and the reason it didn't get rendered, that's what we're gonna tackle next. But for now, if I just refresh this page, then what we should see it's a new uh it's a new pet added, which is a cat Garfield. And uh, and there you go. Now we have uh, the mutation and the query working. Now what we want to do next is we want to make sure that this actually gets updated in real time. Okay, so as soon as we add that, what we want to do is we want to see that image. Uh, show up without us having to refresh the page. Okay, and there's a lot of ways to do this. I'm going to show you one. Uh, but again, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of ways to do this. If you work with Redux or if you if you've already used React hooks, there is a uh, there is a few ways. I'm going to show you one with uh, GraphQL, Apollo, and the cache. Uh, using the cache, how you can update it in real time. But again, there's a lot of ways. Figure out which one works best for you. I'm going to show you one that we uh, we use as a standard. But uh, but again, I think there's a lot of um there's a lot of um options. But yeah, pretty cool, right? We're we're querying the pets, we're adding new pets all through uh, the UI, and our application is working uh, just fine. And again, it wasn't that much change uh, as we've seen just to add Apollo to uh, to uh, already um, to an uh, to a React app. Okay, so now let's go ahead and see how we can do the rendering in real time. So let's go over um, what do we have to do to actually get the UI to render in real time once we actually make an update or any mutation for that matter. Okay, so let's go back over here. Now I want to walk you through this because it is a little um, it's, it's a little cumbersome, okay? So just um, just um, bear with me for a moment. Um, now in this use mutation um, hook, the thing they 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 um, you can pass two arguments to it, okay? So the the new the first argument is the mutation argument, right? So we we wrote over here the the new pet one. That's the first argument that we can pass, okay? And that's the you you at least that's the default one, right? So you always have to pass that one. Now the other one is where we can actually update our um, our uh, the UI. And again, this is just one of them, but uh, it is a recommended uh, one. 
So I'm going to go ahead and it's a function. It's called the, it's an update function. Okay. And uh, the first thing that this update function gets access to is, um, let's see over here, is the cache. So whatever we have on, uh, on the cache at this moment. Now, one important thing to understand is the following. If you were making just an update on one, um, on one node, so remember GraphQL is, um, is a set of nodes and edges, okay? If you're making an update just on one single node, so you just, um, let's say you're in within a user profile or something, right? So you are going to make a, an update to that specific user. Then GraphQL can actually go ahead and because it actually knows the ID and, uh, and the data kind of like matches up exactly, um, then it, it will do the update automatically. So this is not as important when doing updates. Now, whenever we are mutating a list, okay, then at that point we actually have to tell GraphQL or Apollo in this instance, uh, how exactly do we want that mutation to happen? Because it, it won't really know um, any other way because you might be using that data in many places and you might not want it to be updated in all those places. So you might want control over what gets updated and when it gets updated, right? And because of this um, limit, then what we have to do is we actually, you know, it gives us more control, but at the same time, uh, we do have to specify and uh, whenever we're updating a list that, uh, that we do want uh, that list to be updated if we want it to or not, okay? Uh, so the first thing is uh, it gives us access to the previous cache. So whatever the information is at that point, that's what we didn't see the, the site uh, rendering, re-rendering. Uh, so that's the cache. Okay. So whatever the old, uh, the previous, um, data is, that's what we'll have access to in the cache. Okay. And again, if, if you're, if you've ever done a reducer, uh, with Redux or anything, it'll be very similar. So over here we have the cache. Then the next thing, uh, we have access to is data and, uh, and that data is going to be the name of, um, let's see over here. So yeah, the name of this function add pet. Okay. So whatever you name this, that's what you're going to put here. So remember, if you uh, if you alias this with uh, let's say results, and then you aliased it, then over here you would uh, you would write results instead of uh, add pet. Okay. All right. So let's uh, let me go ahead and remove this. All right. So the next thing, uh, once we have that, okay. Let me just make sure I'm reading this correctly. Yeah. So now that we have that, that's kind of the the function signature for the update function. Okay. So the next thing we gotta do is we gotta go ahead and do, we're gonna, I'm gonna put uh, yeah data here. And uh, so this will be a different data. And then this will all make sense. I know it's a, it's a little, um, so remember this is the data object. So all I'm doing here is destructuring it. Okay. So this is the cache. This is the new, um, okay. This is the new, um, the, the new object that we're going to have uh, access to. Okay. So I'm just restructuring, uh, destructuring there. So this data and this data, they're different. Okay. This is object destructuring. And again, uh, you know, we, we have courses on ES six, um, that go more into this, but all we're doing is we're, we're, we're having an object that has a data, um, because of what this returns, if you remember, so that returns a data object. So all we're doing is we're just structuring here just so we can get access to this add a uh, add pad, um, um, object within the data uh, object itself. Okay. Within the result of, uh, of our query. So the first thing we need to do is we need to read from the cache. Okay. And we need to tell it, what do we want to read from the cache? So from the cache, we're going to say read query. And, uh, and then what we have to pass, uh, to it, it's a, uh, a query and the query we want to pass to it is the all pet. So remember the, the list that we want to update after we create a new pet is this all pets query. Okay. So that's the one that we want to, um, kind of, uh, update as, uh, as we create a new one. Okay. Then after we read from the cache, then we're going to say cache and we're going to write now. Okay. We're going to write to that query. And uh, what we're going to write is the following. So the first thing we have to pass is the query. So again, same thing over here, the all pets. Um, and then we have to pass it the data that we want to, um, that we want to actually, uh, write. So in this case, if you remember the data for the pets, um, if you remember how, how this, um, how this query was set up is the pets, right? So that's what we write here. Okay. So it's the pets query. Okay. And within the pets query, what we want to do is, uh, since it's an array, that's what we know, uh, gets returned. That's exactly what we want to update. So at this point, what I'm going to do, it's, uh, I'm going to say add pet. Okay. Which is this function here. So we're going to get the result of this. 
okay, the app pet. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, say data.pets, which is from, um, from this data. If you remember, that's kind of what we passed over here. So of the list, okay, we have the pets from the list. So that's all we're doing here. So we're saying, hey, grab whatever was in that list already and then just add to it the add pet uh, uh, part, okay? And then what we're saying uh, with this query, it's we want to do it just for this list, okay? Just so wherever this list got populated, okay? And then Apollo would do all this thing in the background for you, okay? So you kind of don't have to worry about everything that's going in the background. So that's kind of why I want to walk you through what you do need to understand in order for that to happen. So what we're saying over here is saying, Hey, we're getting access to the cache. Okay, from the cache, we are going to say we're going to set up this uh, this data. Um, we're going to say we're, we're we're it's almost like a subscriber. Okay, we're going to be listening for changes on this uh, on this cache. Okay, and we're going to have a reference to the cache. Once we have a reference to the cache, then we can write to it. Okay, and then what we want to say is you know uh, for this cache, and there are some if if you want to update multiple lists, then you would have to do this multiple times. Okay, uh, that's what I'm saying. There are some there's ways you can abstract this. What we usually do is we abstract this out into an actual update function outside of this. That uh, that way we can probably pass it in an array and uh, and then it does the rest automatically uh, with the previous data and the current data. So we can write our own custom uh, custom uh, reducers. But uh, this way, at least you know all, everything that's going into it. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and uh, rewrite your own function from this uh, function itself, uh, then you can go ahead and do that um, as well. That's what we do uh, internally. So then uh, over here, you pass it the query and then you pass it the data. To the data, you have to pass it, what do you want the data to look like after it's been written, okay? So what you want it to look like after, it's the same way as you did uh, when you passed it into here. So it, it needs to return a pets. So that's where we have the pets there. And then uh, what we wanna do is we wanna say, hey, uh, remember this is immutable. So you can use um, pop or shift or anything like that. Uh, so we're gonna do, um, we're gonna do the spread operator over here with uh, the, the new ES6 uh, syntax, and then to the front of it, we're just gonna add the new add pet, okay? And then uh, that's that's it. That's all. That's all we actually need to do uh, for that. And so I'm gonna go ahead and save it, and then we're gonna test it on our uh, on our server, okay? So let's go ahead and we're gonna create a new pet. We're gonna make it a cat again, and then it's gonna say we're gonna give it a name, and then we're gonna add that pet. And then as you saw we see this cat automatically being updated, the UI updating uh, in real time as we make that update, then we got that uh, that feedback automatically, okay? So that's kind of the that's kind of the, the process you need to go through uh, in, uh, in GraphQL on the client side once you make a mutation and you wanna update a list. Remember, if, uh, if you're not updating a list, so if you're just updating a, a single node, then Apollo can do this for you automatically because it'll just match it um, directly, okay? Uh, the ID of it will match the um, the ID that it's returned from uh, from your actual query. But uh, since we're updating a list, uh, and you may, may have many lists that uh, actually put data together in different ways, and it gets it from the same source, then Apollo account doesn't know uh, which list to update or what it should be listening for. So in this in, in that instance, then we actually have to tell it, hey, we actually want to update this list every single time a mutation happens over here, then uh, make sure that this list also gets updated. Okay, and then this is the way to do it. Um, so again, pretty simple, uh, not that much that goes into it, but, um, but yeah, uh, once you have it, you can see that is pretty cool. We see, uh, once again that, uh, and again, we don't need to like keep track of any of this in a separate store or anything like that. Apollo kind of does all this for us and, uh, and yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. So anyways, let's, uh, let's move on to the next thing. And, uh, then we're going to talk about some directives and, uh, fragments that way we don't have to constantly be repeating ourselves, especially since you saw over here. Uh, we're gonna be um, especially for 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 example once we added a pet and um, and for this um, all pets once we're querying the pet we're kind of repeating ourselves there so I'm gonna show you a little bit a uh, few other tricks that you can do to uh, optimize your queries your mutations but essentially at this point you should feel pretty comfortable uh, with uh, Apollo GraphQL both on the server side and on the client side because now we've kind of read from the database we've mutated. Uh, both on the server and the client, and we've actually um, updated uh, the client in real time so that your application kind of feels, um, you know, um, like it's, um, you know, speedy, even if it's not. Another cool thing about uh, Apollo that uh, that you might have not noticed, again, because it's doing all this for us on the back end, is that Apollo is caching all this, okay? And that's kind of what we had to go through all this right now of the update. But all this, 
uh, whether your data might be offline for a second or your, you know, even if the network takes a little bit longer, you know, your data can actually update ahead of time. And, um, and then Apollo can do all this because it has access to the cache. And then we can update the cache ahead of time before uh, we get something back from the server. If you wanted to do that, you can do that with Apollo because we have access to the cache and that's called optimistic, um, optimistic rendering. And uh, we, we might just cover that in, uh, in a little bit later in the course as well, okay? But uh, anyways, hope you like it so far. Uh, let's, uh, let's go to the next video. All right, so one final thing uh, before we wrap up. Let me just talk about fragments because as you get into the client side, you can see that some of this code can get a little bit repetitive. And I think, uh, especially on the client side, fragments really come in handy. So let's go ahead and create a uh, fragment. As you can see over here, all pets and um, the app pet, these two things, they're, you know, they're all repetitive. And again, if we know anything from programming, uh, one of the main um, um, foundations of programming is keep it dry. And that's kind of what we want to do with fragments. So we're going to say, we're going to create a new const and we're going to go to pets fields. Okay, again, we're gonna go GQL. And then after GQL, we're gonna say fragment. So we're gonna create a new fragment. Let me make sure I spelled that correctly. Yep. Uh, we're gonna call it pets field. Pets fields on pets. Okay. And then pretty much what we wanna do is we wanna grab all this stuff right here. Boom. And put it here. And there we go. All right. So then the next thing we want to do is we have to import the fragment at, uh, I think it's, let me just make sure of this. Yeah. So we're going to, so the next thing we want to do after that, it's we want to import this fragment over here. And since we're using uh, GraphQL uh, string literals, it's important that, um, that, uh, that we put dollar sign uh, before it. So we can go ahead and delete all this. And then we're going to say uh, pets. Yeah, this one here, pets fields. And then we're going to do the same thing for the mutation. And then on the mutation right here, we're going to do pets fields. Okay. So the issue we were getting is uh, instead of over here, what we want to spread is not the actual. So we want to import the pet fields um, object to the bottom, but then we want to actually uh, over here, we want to specify what the actual fragment name is. And uh, in this case, the fragment name is uh, camel case pet fields, not the all uppercase pet fields. So again, just make sure of that. What you want to put in your fragment is the, is the actual um, fragment name. So now we can, Go ahead and do this and clean our code up just a little bit uh make it look nicer and uh yeah there you go that's um and anyways so that's pretty much graphql on the server and the client side uh once again i want to thank you for your time first and foremost for putting time into learning this uh these technologies i think they'll really help you out in your development one more thing um you know uh for making it all the way through i hope this um this course was instructional i hope you liked it a lot if there's any other questions you have leave a comment if you have a review for the course uh please leave a comment it really does mean a lot to me and it helps um you know it helps me create these courses based on your feedback once i update it or the team updates it then uh you know we usually get the feedback that we get from the comments and uh, we go ahead and do that but in any case uh you're always welcome to leave an honest comment if there's something you liked or didn't like if there's something that you would have liked to be explained better, or even if you learn something new and you just want to contribute uh, to the group, there's always people uh, watching these courses. We get a lot of views and, uh, and yeah, anyways, thank you for your time and I hope you enjoy this course. Take care.